Huh? I know. We'll, we'll solve it during this talk. Okay. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to receive uh, Paul Boven from uh, VLBI uh, uh, from Netherlands. He, he will speak about uh, VLBI, Juno Radio, uh, and the White Rabbit. Okay, thank you. What I'll be presenting is work we've done over the past uh, four years, roughly. Uh, my name is Paul Boven, a call sign Papa Echo One November Uniform Tango. And as you might see at the slides, I actually have two affiliations next to my name, and we'll get to that. Uh, the thing that, of course, draws the attention is the very large dish you see over there. That's the Dwingelo Radio Telescope. It's a national monument nowadays, and it is run by volunteers. It's no longer in use by the original owner. And we're going to do some uh, new radio and some VLBI with it. So that's a pretty big dish, and I've actually... For a 25 meter dish, it's easy to calculate that at one and a half gigahertz, you have a beam width of half a degree, the size of the full moon, which is incredibly small for an antenna. But on the other hand, it's actually really poor. Full moon is one pixel. And if you go up in frequency a bit, like uh, five gigahertz, it gets a bit smaller. But compare that, for instance, to a much smaller telescope, Hubble Space Telescope is only a tenth of the size. Still, the resolution is 10 times, 10,000 times better. So to have an equivalent resolution, you would need to size the dish up to 250 kilometers, which is a bit much. There's a solution, however, which is called very long baseline interferometry, and that at least explains one of the acronyms in this talk. So very long baseline interferometry is where you take radio telescopes all over the world, you basically phase them up together as a phased array, um, and you start doing your astronomy with that. On the left, the Joint Institute for VLBI in Europe is the organization that takes all that data, processes it, correlates it. It's also my employer. And the organization itself is called the European VLBI Network. And as you can see from the map, we take European quite wide. It goes as far as uh, Arecibo and South Africa and Rus Russia and China. <coughs> so how does this work? Um, we make a virtual radius telescope almost the size of the Earth. The actual size of your virtual telescope becomes comparable to the longest distance between uh, the two teles any two telescopes. And that gives you resolution not of half a degree or something, but on the order of a milli arc second or even better. And you do this by all looking at the same source with all those telescopes at the same time. Now, before you can actually do, what, do anything with it, you have quite a bit of Doppler because the Earth is rotating. And if you were to stand on the equator, you might not notice, but you're moving around at 465 meters per second. That gives you quite a bit of Doppler shift, so we need to take that out. And then we do a complex cross-correlation between any pairs of telescopes, and that gives us the phase on that particular baseline. And the number of baselines sort of goes up with the square of the number of telescopes. So adding more telescopes um, gives you many more baselines where you're actually measuring the signal. These measurements we express in U and V coordinates, which are in wavelengths, and we put them in something called the UV plane, and then as the Earth rotates, and all the baselines between the telescopes rotate, you start filling up the UV plane in sort of semi-arcs, and after 12 hours, that starts to repeat, because the baseline has completely flipped around. So what you do then is you can start and create a dirty image by just doing an inverse FFT of, of the... Uh, of the data that you have. But that gives you what we call a dirty image, because actually there's many points in the UV diagram where you didn't have a telescope where you don't have data, so you have to make up a lot of the data. And then we have very, very difficult algorithms that actually try and get the best possible image out of, out of that. <coughs> now here are some of the examples what you can actually do with VLBI. On the left is a pretty famous image that came out recently, where at I think 280 gigahertz, uh, the EHT co consortium used VLBI to map the first event horizon of a black hole. The one on the right, uh, we don't have enough resolution to show it properly. Um, it is extremely finely detailed. It is actually a galaxy, uh, or at least an active radio source behind another 
source, and it is, the light is bent around it due to the gravity. So we're not seeing the foreground source, we're seeing the source behind it, and the fact that you get sort of a ring, which is called an Einstein ring, is due to the way how the light, or actually the radio signal, was bent around the foreground source. So what do you need to do some VLBI? You need a radio telescope, and of course, the bigger the better. You can't do VLBI with one telescope, you need at least two. Uh, but again, if you have more, that's better. Each radio telescope needs a very stable frequency reference, where in a phased array, normally everything can run off the same clock. You cannot have the same clock over here and on a different continent. Um, the stability that you need is, say, you're observing at 10 gigahertz, then over a thousand seconds, you do not want the phase of that 10 gigahertz signal to appreciably be appreciably change. So you need very high stability in the order of 10 to the minus 14. Uh, for longer observation times, actually what starts happening is that the turbulence in the ionosphere or the troposphere starts to destroy the coherence between the stations. Um, we can still observe longer, but then you have to do tricks like phase referencing where you look at the source, you look at the calibrator, you look at the source for five minutes, calibrator five minutes, you go back and back forth and back and forth, and you do that for 12 hours. The sensitivity for this depends crucially on the bandwidth that you have. And if you have four times as much bandwidth, you have twice as much sensitivity. So we try to do this with high bandwidth. Uh, so you have to imagine the number of baselines that you form goes up as the uh, square of the number of stations, and then you're doing this with high bandwidth. So you need some real horsepower to process all these cross-correlations, to do all these averaging. Um, and that's called a correlator, and we run the EVN correlator. Uh, is being run by Jive. Now to actually phase up things uh, to a fraction of a wavelength, you don't just need to know, you, you need to know very accurately their location on the Earth, but also very accurately how the Earth is rotating, um, how the tides are actually moving the telescopes around, because tides don't just happen to water, but actually the surface that we're on goes up and down up to 40 centimeter twice a day. You wouldn't notice, because everything around you does the same, but if you go a quarter of an Earth further, you get the opposite effect. So all of these effects need to be taken out until you're at the order of a wavelength in order to actually be able to do this correlation. So this telescope I've already mentioned is the Dwingelo Radio Telescope. Um, it, it, uh, it was opened in 1956. It's a 25-meter dish with a 7.7-millimeter steel mesh wire surface. So that, that these two parameters basically already set the frequency range, so it's going to be somewhere around 100 megahertz up to 8 gigahertz. When you go beyond 8 gigahertz, the photons get so small that they start to fall through, through the mesh. It's 120 tons. It's a historic monument. We're extremely careful, careful with it. Um, and it's operated nowadays by volunteers, and I'm one of those volunteers. The organization is called Camras, and you can uh, have a look at their website. We also have pages in English. And what we do is, first of all, we try and maintain the instrument, improve it. We also do radio astronomy. We do all kinds of ham radio activities, including moon bounce. Uh, we do education and outreach. Uh, yeah, moon bounce with a 25-meter dish is kind of easy. <laughs> um, we, we have a SETI project. We have ver various art projects. There's qu quite a lot of going on. It's a very fun club to be a member of. So I said earlier, you need a lot of bandwidth. And actually, the bandwidth scales as the square law of the, sorry, the sensitivity squares with the, the sensitivity scales with the, see that's what, you, what I get when I try to hurry. The sensitivity scales with the square root of the bandwidth. And that means you run into limits in either your network throughput or in your storage capacity. And so you want to store your samples or represent them as efficiently as possible. And of course, using fewer bits for your samples means that you can have more samples. And the most extreme case of that would be only one bit per sample, but then you get a lot of quantization noise. And the trade-off surprisingly ends up pretty close to only two bits per sample. So almost all VLBI is done at only two bits per sample resolution. And imagine that you're having a noise signal, and these are basically the bit where you want like a third of the area to be one bit, a third of the other, and then one-sixth for the outliers. That gives you kind of the best sensitivity. 
And that also means that if you are reducing your data to two bits, you actually have to have an AGC or something like that to keep it in that range. And then at a much lower rate, you do a power measurement so you actually know um, uh, how much energy was coming in. Now, two-bit quantization sounds easy. It's not, turns out. There are at least two styles of doing rounding, and actually there's many more. Uh, there's the C-style rounding, which is basically truncation, where anything between minus one and plus one becomes a zero, which is not what you want in signal processing because you, got a, uh, you basically got one bit that is twice as big as any, any other bit. And in signal processing, we usually do minus and half to plus and half, that becomes a zero. And then the next stage, you get one, two, three, et cetera. And then it becomes a nice staircase function without any uh, strange plateaus in it. So GNU Radio would usually do it the right way. But when I was trying to get my VLBI stuff going, I, I noticed sometimes I get really strange results. And that led to my first uh, GNU Radio, uh, I'm not sure to call it contribution, but a bug report. And what you, what you see on the graph there is I graphed, I basically put random values in the radio and I made a graph of all the values that uh, were rounded down to zero. And you see normally it is nicely behaved between minus and a half and plus and a half, but every now and then it runs between minus one and two one. And what you also see, it's very periodic. And it turns out, and um, Marcus uh, Muller over there was the guy uh, who helped a lot with this and figured out what was going on. A lot of the heavy lifting in GNU Radio is done in the vector-optimized vector library of kernels. And, you, and that makes use of the, uh, of the high-performance instructions on your, on your CPU, like SSE. And you feed a lot of samples at the same time, but there are some leftovers at the end of a GNU Radio uh, uh, packet. And they would then be done in C, because they wouldn't fit in the next SSE block. Yeah, yeah it took, this took a while to figure out. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, nah, <laughs> I'm sure there's been a more stupid one. And it, apparently it, it had gone unnoticed for a very long time, but because I was actually only trying to find uh, values between 0, 1, 2, and 3, these were the only values I, I was allowing, it, it kind of stood out. If you end up with a block size that is a multiple uh, of the Volk size, then possibly that might fix it. Yeah. So I already said high bandwidth. Um, we're actually using a twin RX that has an output of two times 80 megahertz, uh, which is sampled over sampled at 80 at, at 100 megahertz. Um, the most efficient way to record it is 16 bits, even though it's 12 bit data. But that gives you 3.2 gigabits coming out of your backend, out of your SDR. Now, if you record that to the memory of your PC, that's easy. But then it's full in 10 seconds. And that's not quite what we're looking for. So I started recording this data to disk, and I ran into a world of trouble. Uh, it immediately starts losing packets, crashing, stopping. Um, and then I found a tool. It's called GR Analysis. And GR Analysis itself has a recording called SpecRec for spectrum recording. And that works a little bit better, because it's not as bursty as, uh, as the, the regular GNU radio tools. It puts all the samples in like a circular buffer and they get flushed to disk really regular, so it doesn't save up a lot of samples and then dump it, because then all of a sudden your system is very busy with your disk controller, and then it forgets about the network controller and it misses packets. Unfortunately, when it runs out of this circular buffer, it just goes, oh, I'm done. Um, and it is really not trivial to record even only 50 mega sample, uh, even on a very beefy serv server with 18 disks in parallel, we managed to sometimes get it running for hours, but very often it would like crash like half after half an hour, and we had no idea why. So there's uh, lots of room for improvement. Another issue I ran into is that new radio basically supports two kinds of uh, timing. You can uh, have a GPS receiver in your in your USRP, and then you can just tell it set your time from GPS, or you can use the external 10 megahertz and a one PPS, and then you got this little drop down that says unknown PPS, and then it waits for the PPS and then it starts at that point, but then it sets the time to zero, which is somewhere in 1970. Um, which is not what I was looking for, because I need accurate timestamps on my data. So this is actually listed somewhere in the knowledge base, but what you should do is you w wait for a PPS edge. And then actually, because the PPS edge and your PC time might not be perfectly aligned, you wait a bit more. 
Then you read out the PPS time and you put that um, to your USB, but you don't say, now it is this time, no. You say, at the next beep, it will be this time plus one second. Um, and then you wait for the half, half of a second that is remaining. And then you have apparently set the right time to your USB. So I implemented the code you see over there in uh, UHD RxC file and later on also in the, in the SpecRex software. So I was listing a number of things that you need for, uh, for doing VLBI, and one of them is you need a very stable and accurate clock. And these hydrogen masers, they run at about 200,000 to 300,000, which as a volunteer organization, we cer certainly don't have. But some of you might already have heard of White Rabbit. And White Rabbit is an open protocol, an open standard for distributing frequency and time. It was invented at CERN, and they were nice enough they made it an uh, open standard. And they use it for beam control for the, uh, for the LHC, for, for getting all of that in time. And originally, it was for 10 kilometer reach. That's the design. And you could do thousands of nodes up to a nanosecond. Well, up to a nanosecond can still be several phases, so that's not quite good enough for us. Uh, and also 10 kilometers, the distance between radio telescopes tends to be a lot more. So we started to tinker with White Rabbit and try and improve it a bit. And this actually became part of the Asterix uh, project, which is a, a Horizon 2020 research project from the EC, which is about bringing together astrophysics, particle astrophysics, astronomy, and they all have similar challenges about large amounts of data, about timing, distribution timing. There was also a work package on citizen science, but we worked on the Cleopatra work package uh, where lots of different research into White Rabbit was happening. And the end result of that was, uh, because this could be a complete separate talk and we don't have the time, the end result of that is that we have the Westerbork Synthesis Radio Telescope at the right, which is a professional Dutch radio telescope. They have a very good hydrogen maser. Then over here, we have a white rabbit switch. And then from Westerbork to Dwingelo is 35 kilometer by fiber. And that wasn't actually really challenging. So we take a little detour. We go from Westerbork, we go to Groningen over 65, sorry, 67 kilometer fiber optical amplifier. And then we go back to Westerbork and then over Surfnet, we go to Dwingelo. So that in total is a 169 kilometer link. And we had all kinds of improvements. These are special white rabbit switches with um, high stability, with low, low jet daughter boards. Um, we're using not the standard cheap optics that you have, but we're actually using frequency stabilized um, lasers. So, you, so the laser wavelength doesn't change that much. And it has a huge improvement for the sensitivity, sorry, not the sensitivity, for the stability of the clock signal that you get out of there. And the goal here was to show, can we actually get close enough to a maser to do VLBI? Um, so we had this little detour of 67 kilometer north and then back south again, and we measured the LN deviation. And this is a little bit of a complicated graph, we'll concentrated on the left half, which is the LN deviation. And what you see here in red and then continued into blue is the actual performance of the link. Um, most of the other lines here don't really matter. You can read it at your leisure later on. But the black line is actually the, the performance from the sales brochure of a hydrogen maser. So basically everywhere between one second and say a thousand seconds, we are within an order of magnitude from the, from the maser and then we actually start to get even better. So being within an order of magnitude from a hydrogen maser is actually good enough to do VLBI if you're not doing it at too high a frequency. So we started doing VLBI, and this is where GNU Radio comes in. We had an Atus X310 with twin RX motherboard, um, and then you need to do a lot of signal processing to actually get it into the format that is used for VLBI data. So I'll quickly run you through the flowchart. We start with the recorded data. Well, this is something everyone should know. You make it complex. And then, because it's 80 megahertz oversampled at 100 megahertz, the first thing I did was a resampler of 5 by 4. So now we're sampled at 80 megahertz. And then what we do is we actually shift it by 8 megahertz uh, by, adding a, by having a sign and multiplying with it. And then we put it in a polyphase channelizer, and that gives me five channels, five frequency bands. And by first shifting the little bit, 
the bandages actually come together in the same band, and I just throw them away here in the null sync. And that leaves me with four bands of 16 megahertz each. Now each band goes through the same three steps. We double the sample rate, uh, we shift it up, and then we throw away the imaginary part. And this is basically converting it from complex sampled at 16 megahertz to real sample data at 32 mega sample per second. So we got four subbands coming out of here, and then we go through them. We take uh, 32,000 samples of one, and of next, and next, and next, and then we return. And that's because the packet size is 8,000 bytes. And now we get to the part that was a bit of a headache, which is how do I turn these floating point numbers into two-bit numbers? And because of the bug I ran into, it, it's done in two steps. First, I go from float to char, but I use the whole 255, 255 range that's available. And then using a map function, I basically generate a little lookup table that turns it into a two-bit number. And then we have only one custom block in this whole flow chart, which is called VDIF packetize that takes these two-bit samples, puts them together into a byte, adds timestamp, adds the uh, station indicator, um, and adds the channel number, and then we go back to a file. And this is coming soon to GitHub, if you want to play with it yourself. And that actually, in August last year, led to the very first fringes again for the Dwingelo telescope, the very first VLBI observation, except that it wasn't. It already did VLBI in 1978. But after that, the VLBI went to the bigger telescope, to Westerbork, and this thing did other signs and eventually got disused and got adopted by amateurs. But now we can do VLBI again. There were still some issues back then. Uh, like I said, we could only record to memory for ten, uh, at first, so that was only 10 seconds. And actually, running the flow graph that you see here as a background, um, I can run it on, on a brand new i1900 at 20% of real time. So if you do an hour of observing, you have five hours of calculating to do. And that's for only 256 megabit. What I actually wanted is uh, a full 1024 megabit. Also, for this very first test, we didn't use the hydrogen maser yet. Uh, we had to use a rubidium time base. The reason for that is that we were missing 270 meters of fiber between the Astron offices and the radio telescope. Uh, Astrom was kind enough to donate some leftover fiber. This is 510 meters of 144 strand fiber, and 144 fibers is excessive, but the price was impossible to beat. So we started to plan, run around the telescope, into the woods, into the building, 100 meter inside the building. We rented the digger. We had some real fun with our volunteers actually digging the trench, putting the, the conduit in. The, the green conduit is special, uh, is special fiber conduit. And then, of course, on a rainy day somewhere in uh, January or February, we actually started pushing the fiber through, through that conduit. And it might be surprising, but you can actually just by hand, uh, by adding a bit of lubrication, you can just push fiber through over 120 meters of conduit. And if you keep pushing, it gets up to speed. And if you stop, there is so much mass moving, it actually starts pulling itself forward. Uh, the other thing we had to do is, it's a radio telescope, it rotates, and that's not something you want to do to single mode fiber. So one of our volunteers designed and constructed this very nice uh, cable wrap so that in the one and a half rotation that the telescope can do, we never put too much stress on the fiber. And then, because we like challenges, we ended up splicing around fiber as well. So far we've done 24 out of 144. You have to imagine for a... Uh, um, hobbyists like us, doing 24 fibers takes a full day, and you have to do it at the beginning of the fiber, in the middle where it goes into the telescope is another day, and then inside the telescope is another full day. But we have 144 fibers, so there's plenty of room for expansion. And what we end up with is this. This is actually inside the Faraday cage, inside the telescope. Um, this is a white rabbit switch, and into it you get fiber, which actually runs all the way to the Westerbork telescope, either by 35 kilometers of fiber or 169 kilometers of fiber. Uh, we have some optical filters, uh, and this is the Etis X310, and I actually managed to borrow an extra one so that we could compare them at the same time. And we were actually getting a little bit in a crunch. We were getting close to the end of the project, and it was about time to show that it worked. And we had a very good opportunity coming up. 
The uh, European VLBI network runs a network monitoring experiment in front at the start of every observing session where all the telescopes participate. You look at a bright, boring, uh, compact source and then you see if your fringes are any good. So we asked if you could join. Uh, unfortunately, um, that network doesn't usually operate at the frequencies that the Vengelo telescope works at. So it's 19 of them, one of us. So we actually had to take the elevator, go up into the receiver, and install new LNAs at Wind Force 6, which was no fun. Uh, but this actually led to the very first time that we had fringes on a remote maser over White Rabbit. And this was not just a 10 second observation, we had now solved most of the recording problems, so this ran for 10 minutes, this ran for hours. And then if you start looking at your data, you start seeing funny stuff. If you set a frequency on your USRP, it is not actually the exact frequency. It's accurate to about a hertz, but you can be a little bit off. And if you're integrating a signal for 10 minutes, uh, or even just 10 seconds, that starts to add up. And we, we were seeing like a fringe, like it was good for like eight seconds, and then the ninth second it was gone, and then we came back. And that's because we had sort of phase jumps, because unlike all these professional telescopes, we were a little bit off with our freq frequency, which we managed to correct in software. The other thing, because this was all a little bit short notice, uh, we installed these new LNAs. They had a lot, slightly less gain. We had slightly more cable damping. Um, we, we, we didn't quite have enough gain. Still, we got a very nice cross-correlation peak. So on this axis, you see different possible time offsets that you try. You, you measure the cross-correlation. And only if you get all these time offsets really right, and, you, and they keep being right for the whole uh, 10 seconds or whatever you're calculating, then you get a nice, very sharp peak. And actually, the amplitude and the complex value of the peak, that is what goes into the next stage of VLBI. So what we actually ended up doing is using VLBI to verify the link performance to show that we could actually do VLBI with this. Uh, the black line is the same line you, show, you, you saw earlier, was the loopback line, the performance. The two other lines are doing VLBI between the Westerbork telescope and the Dwingelo telescope on a very strong source. Um, once over the 35 kilometer link in purple and once over the 169 kilometer link. And basically, I don't have error bars on this yet, but we have many more of these observations. There are no real difference between here and here. It, it, it looks like there's a little bit of difference, but I also have observations where it's the other way around. And after that, it starts to sort of uh, deviate. This is where the ionosphere becomes turbulent, where actually you lose coherence, not because your clock is bad, but because um, the ionosphere is, becomes unpredictable. And the, the other factor that you have is your source is not a perfect point source, so that starts to add up to, to your image as well. And now we get to the uh, part that I uh, should have actually skipped. Um, like I said, the flowchart was only doing it at uh, one-fifth of real time. Uh, the output, if we're doing one full channel from a 20rex, 3.2 gigabit per second. The actual output that we get out of the flowchart is only 256 megabit per second. So I wanted to try and offload all the processing to the FPGA. And GNU Radio has this very nice facility for this called RFNOC. And we've got the X310 X because it has 1,540 multipliers, so you can actually put some filtering in there. So what you see over here is the flowchart sort of that I made into RFNOC. So this is, again, is where you get your samples, 100 mega samples. We do the same thing. We bring it down to 80 mega samples. And now, instead of doing a polyphase filter bank, I opted to have four digital down converters. So I mix it with minus 24, minus 8, et cetera. So all offset by 60 megahertz. And then resample it, fractional resampler again, this time 5 to 1. Um, and that gives me 16 megahertz of bandwidth. Then I should quantize it to two bits, and I need this AGC. I should interleave them, and then I should add the actual VDIF header and the timestamp. Um, but as you can see, those are actually in dotted lines, so I haven't gotten around to implementing that. And at the moment, my FPGA is getting pretty full. So that's going to take some time to make it more efficient, to actually make it fit. But it's going to be a real challenge to do four X outputs on one X310, push that through the FPGA, even though it only outputs a lousy gigabit at the end. So that brings me to the conclusions. We built a working VLBI backend thanks to GNU Radio and just off-the-shelf SDRs, and that worked. 
we got fringes, and we were able to show that we can transfer a reference clock using WhiteRabbit over an existing production by uh, DWM fiber network by using wavelengths that are not in use for the data traffic, so nobody had to lose their connectivity while we added this or tinkered with it. And the stability we get is good enough for doing VLBI, and I've calculated it should be good enough up to observing frequencies of about 12.4 gigahertz. And finally, we have not really been able to see performance difference between a 35 kilometer link and a 169 kilometer link, so it should be possible to support longer links even. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, any question? Uh, yeah, you talked about a s small tuning error of 0 0.187 hertz. Uh, is this due to a fractional uh, PLL or something like that, or is this uh, something else? Uh, yeah, it, it, it is partly fractional PLL. It is also the, the resolution of the DDS that does the tuning uh, in, in the final part. Um, within the flowchart, or actually no, sorry, it's it's the DDS that's in the FPGA still, yeah. And I was running all these observations with uh, integer end tuning, uh, so that we didn't have extra phase noise due to um, due to the uh, DDS jumping around, etc. Sorry, I, I I don't know. I would have to look it up. Yeah, the phase resolution, I don't know. Thank you for your presentation. So you have four channels for AOF channel, but you have only one channel for transport. So you or you, you manage the, the passage for, from four channel to one channel. Um, so the way the TwinRx works is that both channels are basically in sync. So um, you get them together in new radio, and then only the second motherboard is the other one, um, and within either your flowchart or within GNU Radio, you can simply configure the, um, the source block to have two outputs. So that already gives you both outputs of a single Twanerix. And then the other two, you basically uh, synchronize them both to the same clock and you treat them separately and only in the interleaving block do you add them together. I, uh, thanks for your talk. I didn't uh, understood uh, where does the timestamp come from when uh, you showed uh, in your GNU radio design, uh, you show a block that uh, puts the timestamps before writing the samples to file. Yeah. Where does the timestamp come from? Uh, th this is all still very hackish, hackish, and I can actually show you. Uh, where's the flowchart yeah, here? Uh, actually, the VDIF packetized block has two parameters, and this first parameter is actually just a Unix timestamp. So I know when I'm going to observe, I start my recording at that time, and later on I tell my, time my flowchart this was the time that recording started, and start counting forward from there. Okay. Okay. So this, this ties together with um, making it, the other half of it is making it actually start at the time they, that you want, by setting the URCP to the correct time locked to the PPS and the 10 megahertz. So then you give your recording software a starting time and spec rec actually supports that. Um, and then later on you use the same time in your flow chart as a parameter. So have you looked at where you're, like you said, you didn't, couldn't do real time, you were down to 120th, so. Uh, where, where's all the time going? Where is, is the return resampler? Is it the polyphase? Um, so we're definitely losing quite a bit here. Yeah. Uh, because that's running at the highest rate, and I've actually, you know, re relaxed the, the 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 filter parameters quite a bit here to make it go at this speed. Um, I've actually done all kinds of tests where you know I I basically replaced parts of the flow chart with, with null sinks, etc. But the main culprit seems to be this one. Okay. Thanks. And then clearly th that one. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm, thank you again, Paul.
And now we are pleased to receive uh, Carolina Cardenas Olaya um, for talking about uh, fully digital electronics um, implemented on Red Pitaya. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so my name is Carolina Cárdenas. I work in the National Institute of Meteorological Research, uh, mainly on digital electronics for time and frequency applications. Uh, today I will talk about the fully dig uh, a project in which we are currently working on, that is the fully digital electronics for fiber link frequency transfer implemented at Red Pitaya. Uh, optical clocks are currently available at, uh, with an accuracy of the range in 10 and minus 18. Uh, these uh, ultra stable signals are exploited mainly in uh, applications such as VLBI, uh, radio astronomy, relativistic geodesy, and in the measurement of the verification of uh, fundamental constants. Um, most of these applications uh, are based on the comparison of two or more optical clocks that are currently or are in general not co-located. So uh, a suitable medium for time or frequency transfer is required. Uh, the, cap the capability of the optical fiber links uh, uh, for reaching a frequency stability and, and uncertainty of the order of 10 and minus 19 uh, has been uh, demonstrated um, through different experiments. Uh, however, uh, mechanical stress, temperature uh, fluctuations, or environmental factors uh, generate uh, fiber length fluctuations that uh, they generate uh, the, the stability of the frequency being transferred. Uh, so in order to compensate for this fiber noise, uh, two techniques are in general applied. The Doppler, that is the traditional technique, and the two-wake, that is more recently applied. In the general scheme of the Doppler compensation, uh, the two ultra-stable signals are, uh, that are located in different laboratories are sent to the remote end uh, through uh, two parallel uh, bidirectional fibers. Mm, then the um, fiber noise is uh, detected by comparing the transmitted signal uh, with the, return, the, see the drone trip that is returned back from the remote end. Um, in order to, to distinguish the, this return signal from parasitic reflections, uh, oh, sorry, uh, two acoustic modulators are added uh, along the transmission path uh, in the local and the remote sites. In this point, the, the bit node between the transmitter signal and the return uh, signal is detected by photodetection and the phase error uh, could be actively compensated by, by acting on the frequency that drives the acoustic modulator in the local or in the remote end. Uh, in the case of the two-way technique, the signal is sent to, towards the remote user uh, uh, contemporaneously if, in, in, at both sides. So the comparison is based on a single trip of the signal. So uh, for this case, the, the signal is only affected by once by the noise of the fiber, while in the Doppler compensation, uh, we found uh, affected the signal twice the noise of the fiber. Uh, an additional phase and amplitude detector is added at both sides for monitoring uh, purposes. So uh, when implementing these techniques, three, three critical conditions should be taken into account. The detection bandwidth that uh, should be wide enough in order to track the phase information before the coherence gets lost due to the noise. 
Um, in current implementation, this uh, detection bandwidth is around 100 kilohertz. Uh, that represents a limiting factor for long links or noisy links in general. Uh, also, the photodetection uh, generates additive noise that is revealed as uh, excess of noise in the measurement. Mm, this is normally uh, remove, removed by reducing the detection bandwidth. So here, uh, uh, finely tuning of the detection bandwidth could be advisable in order to guarantee an adequate signal to noise ratio uh, for avoiding the generation of cycle slips. Uh, finally, the, the polarization should be maintained aligned in order to avoid the degradation of the signal to noise ratio and consequently the generation of cycle slips. Um, currently, this is done through a uh, polarization control uh, in order to guarantee the uh, continuous operation. Um, the traditional implementation is based on a tracking VCO that uh, cleans up the photodetection noise and uh, eventually amplification and also a frequency divider that increases the dynamic range of the mixer. Uh, afterward, a servo uh, compensates for the fiber noise by acting on the frequency that drives the acoustic modulator. Uh, if, uh, for monitoring purposes and uh, for acquire the phase information, a phase meter is required. This kind of configuration has been demonstrated to work well. However, it uh, has low uh, flexibility and are not predisposed for efficient reconfiguration, monitoring, and uh, remote operation. So uh, we think on uh, apply the advantages of the digital implementations uh, that are mainly the reconfigurability and flexibility. And in, in this implementation. So we plan to uh, implement uh, the compensation algorithm of the FPGA in order to reduce the latency between the different blocks and in this manner increase the bandwidth, the detection bandwidth. So the proposed system uh, acquires directly uh, the bit node uh, that represents the fiber noise using a high-speed analog to digital converter followed by a fully digital phase detector. Uh, after that, uh, a phase error could be compensated actively by, adding, by acting on the frequency of a numerical control oscillator that acts on the acoustic optic modulator through a high-speed digital to analog converter. The entire system is uh, clocked uh, by a low noise reference um, through uh, the internal PLL of the system. The proposed implementation um, is based on IQ detector. So we uh, retrieve not only the phase, but also the amplitude information that uh, is used uh, for feeding a simplex algorithm for uh, perform the polarization control. Also, the bandwidth uh, of the system uh, could be finely tuned by changing the parameters of a uh, uh, low-pass filter chain. Uh, the system is implemented on uh, RedPitaya, that is an open source platform that integrates a 14-bit dual-channel analog to digital converter working at 125 MHz, uh, a 14-bit dual-channel digital to analog converter also working at 125 MHz sample per, sec per second, and a system on chip that embeds a processor and F an FPGA. Uh, the fully digital two-channel system uh, is implemented using a 16% of the FPGA resources. Uh, the system uh, works in subsampling at 125 MHz, so we remove the anti-aliasing filter uh, 
pest browsing red pitaya because mainly our input signals are uh, at 80 megahertz and higher. The system features a 10 megahertz detection bandwidth that is tunable down to one kilohertz. In order to verify the viability or the factibility of the implementation of the system, we first perform um, the characterization of the noise of the different components of the repitaya. The critical components that are the analog to digital converter and the digital to analog converter that are the interfaces with the analog signals and also the PLL that will be the base for the system time base. So for do doing that, uh, we use the power spectral density and the alien, the alien variance in order to evaluate the performance of these components uh, at frequency close to the carrier. So based on this information, we observe that red pitaya will be uh, limited by the noise of the PLL that is around two per 10 and minus 12 at one second. Mm, based on this information, we uh, estimate the, the noise contribution of the electronics for each uh, technique. Uh, and so, analyzing the frequency fluctuations of our signal. So thanks to the leverage between the RF and the optical frequencies, uh, we expect a, a limitation around uh, 10 per 10 and, per, uh, 10 and minus 18 at one second for the Doppler technique, and six per 10 and minus 19 at one second for the two wakes technique. So the accuracy of the instrumentation will be more or less 100 times better that uh, is needed. Um, in order to verify all the, the the features of the system and uh, the correct performance of the instrument. We are currently working in the implementation of a, a fiber emulator that consists in a polarization controller and a fiber noise uh, emulator. This is performed uh, inside the FPGA in order to uh, take advantage of the bandwidth of the SOC, of the system on chip for analyzing mainly the, the features at long term. For instance, the generation of cycle slips that uh, in current implementations are presented one cycle is one minute or two minutes. Uh, so this emulator could be activated or disactivated in that way that the simplex algorithm for can act directly on an external polarization controller and uh, the action of this correction of the phase uh, also drives directly the acoustic modulator. When the phase emulator is active, uh, all the noise the actions or simulation is performed uh, internally. So the DAC output will be feeding the system and we can emulate in that way um, a change in the fiber length or different types of noise uh, that uh, can affect uh, our fiber and the frequency being transmitted. Mm, these are the very first preliminary results that uh, because our system has the capability of acquire uh, different uh, points of the chain. I mean, uh, we can acquire the amplitude, the phase error, the phase correction, or the different outputs of the emulator. Uh, so these results were uh, acquired by feeding the system with the output of the duct in open loop and uh, without any noise contribution. So we are not analyzing these uh, results, but we are expecting that uh, these are the, the limitation of the instrument. Uh, so for concluding, uh, we implement a digital instrument for the detection and compensation of the noise introduced by the fiber. 
Uh, it allows the implementation of the two schemes, the Doppler and the two-way, in closed and open loop, um, by only changing the parameters of the system. And in addition, it allows the implementation of the polarization control that is very useful for avoiding uh, the cycle slips that are affecting uh, or limiting the, the application in long links. Uh, the use of the internal PLL simplifies the system architecture since the an external synthesizer is not required. And also because the difference between the noise in the PLL and the converters, we have a 40 dB of input dy dynamic. Uh, a fiber noise simulator is under development uh, with the aim of studying the critical requirements like detection bandwidth, uh, signal to noise ratio, the polarization uh, under different scenarios. So different ty typologies of noise, uh, like white noise or random walk, and different labels. Um, now we are interested in a study uh, deeper genu radio in order uh, to implement uh, in the near future the post-processing of the signals in we, we are work working on. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, any question? Um, whenever you were or you are working on, on the modulation schemes, you work at baseband because the rate PTI is working at baseband. Have you investigated what uh, what would be the so, so you show that the limitation is obviously the PLL uh -huh. increased by a factor of ten, uh, and the PL and the clock is coming from the PLL of of the zinc. Mm -hmm. Now with the newer uh, chips that we're seeing from analog device, they have a different clocking scheme because they they will generate their own PLL. Have you, have you had a look at, uh, at, at some of these uh, frequency transposition chips as opposed to working directly at baseband? Uh, no, we ha no, I don't uh, see that yet. But also, this, uh, because this scheme will take as reference a low noise uh, clock. So, but yes, maybe it will be a good idea, so I will check it out. I'm curious to know what, what, what is the PLL performance of, of, of these new chips. I mean. Zinc is obviously not a radio frequency chip. Mm. Here we're talking about radio frequency dedicated chips. So, yeah. Okay, so they yes, maybe we'll did a bit more work on this. Okay. Uh, in the past, uh, we did some investigation about uh, residual noise of uh, frequency multiplication. So what we have seen is that uh, if uh, you use uh, the PLL that is embedded uh, into an FPGA, Basically, uh, they introduce uh, a short-term degradation of the order of 10 to the minus uh, 12 at, uh, at one second. We also characterized the internal PLL of, of DDS, uh, for example, the 9912 from analog devices. And in that case, uh, the, the residual noise of the PLL is about 10 times better. So what we expect, uh, we, we, we can, uh, now we have uh, a demo board, we, we will measure it, and we will characterize it by using the same methodologies. But what we expect uh, is uh, to get uh, a similar result with respect to the AD9912. Yes, and uh, if you use a direct clock with that DDS, you gain an additional uh, factor 10 improvement. So uh, you can range from 10 to the minus 12 at one second, to 10 to the minus 13 uh, with uh, better uh, multiplier, and uh, to 10 to the minus 14 at one second uh, with the direct clock. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, um, so we knew that uh, 10 to the minus 12 uh, uh, is, uh, can be improved, but uh, for fiber link, uh, there is a leverage of a factor uh, of uh, 1 million that uh, reduces this contribution by such factor. As uh, have you have seen, uh, the contribution of the red pitaya was uh, about uh, 10 to the minus 18 at one second. 
And uh, the best uh, optical clocks uh, uh, are uh, at 10 to the minus 18 at 10,000 seconds. So we have a, about a factor 100 of margin. So, but there are other application, uh, especially the one uh, in uh, radio frequency, where uh, the residual noise of the, P the PLL is uh, very important. And so we are curious to see uh, what's the level of the new chip. Thank you, Claudio. Other question? Um, on slide 18, do you understand the peaks in your plot? Uh, here? Yes. Not yet. Uh, we are currently analyzing it, uh, but uh, because here we are working in common mode with the clock of the system, so we think there is not the PLA that introduced this peak, so, but no, we are just uh, analyzing for only the data. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you. Um. <laughs> and now we are pleased to present uh, Nicolas Galland. For frequency locking a laser uh, on the spectral hole pattern. introduction and um, yeah. sorry uh, today we show you what uh, we are doing with the uh, new radio and the uh, software defined uh, radio platform in the range of measuring uh, optical uh, properties of the light and uh, use that to stabilize the laser uh, to a special uh, device so as an introduction I will talk about the world of um, atomic clocks in which currently the the primary standards are microwave clocks, working at tens of gigahertz frequency. But the new trend is uh, to the development of optical atomic clocks, and which are working at uh, hundreds of terahertz frequency, so in the optical domain. And for those clocks uh, to meet the better performances, it is required to develop uh, more stable lasers. And that's what we are trying to do uh, on my experiment. So we are using a special medium uh, whose first um, property is to have um, this kind of uh, absorption spectrum around uh, optical frequency. So this is typically 500, uh, 580 nanometers, so it's the uh, yellow uh, light. And it has some absorption uh, up to 70% with a uh, broadening of 2 uh, gigahertz. However, if you place this material in a um, cryogenic uh, situation, so below uh, typically 7 Kelvin, you are able, by sending a narrow laser at a given frequency in the absorption, so anywhere uh, you want, in the middle you have better contrast for what we will do, uh, you will be able to create a small hole inside the absorption with typical line width of 4 kilohertz that will stay in place uh, where you burned it, even if you switch off your laser, uh, or even if the laser moves, for tens of hours typically at 4 Kelvin. And this here is the thing that we will want to uh, uh, lock the frequency of a laser to. So if you zoom a bit uh, in this, you see that we are able to burn holes at 3.5 kilohertz width, and that we will use them as frequency discriminator for uh, stabilizing the frequency of the laser. We know by the Kramer's coning relations that uh, when an uh, optical wave is going through a medium with such a uh, shape of uh, absorption, uh, the phase of the optical wave will uh, experience some dephasing, which will depend on, uh, frequ on frequency tuning with respect to the center, which has this shape, so which is basically linked to the Hilbert transform of the shape of the absorption. And this here provides a beautiful error signal to uh, obtain a correction for the laser frequency. So this is the thing we want to measure uh, with our setup. A bit on the experimental setup, Everything starts with a cryostat. So this is the big machine we use to cool the, the crystal. Our crystal is inside this uh, chamber here. So this is typically one meter long. So big machine. 
and that's to have a small temperature for the crystal. The first thing we do is that we send a master laser, we call master laser, which is an infrared laser doubled to a yellow light. And we send it to be as a local oscillator, an optical local oscillator, because we want to measure the phase of optical wave, which is impossible with a photodiode, but you can compare phase between optical waves. So this will be the reference. That's why we put it completely outside of the absorption, and it will see no influence of the medium, and we put pretty big power. On my experiment, one milliwatt is big power. And this, la this laser is uh, also pre-stabilized to a fabric cavity so that the line width of the laser is reasonably narrow to be able to, to have a, a narrow hole. We then use another laser, which is the same kind of laser, uh, same, uh, same uh, color, which will be also sent to the crystal and which uh, is going through an acoustic modulator, which is an electro-optic device that will be able to shift the frequency of the light according to the frequency you send on the RF input. And also, if you have a special signal on the input, you can have a special spectrum in the light. So you can change the, the shape of the spectrum in the light uh, in the few megahertz uh, bandwidth. This laser will be phase-locked to the first one to benefit from the same stability, at least at the beginning. And uh, we have a tunable offset in frequency between the two so that we can precisely control the position of the slave with respect to the master. Uh, for the master, we don't exactly choose the position because it's stabilized to the cavity, but for the slave, we can choose uh, where, where, where it is on the, on the absorption line. Typically, we put it in the middle. Uh, and the power we use is typically in the range of between 100 nano, nanowatts to a few microwatts, depending on the phase of the um, experiment. We use also frequency comb to measure the frequency of the laser because now we are trying to, to see what kind of uh, stability we can achieve. And everything of this here is driven using a, so a SDR uh, board and a computer. One output is generating the signal that we send here to be able to sculpt the, sh the, the shape of the spectrum of the light. The other output is driving the offset between the two lasers to make this one move over uh, which kind of uh, range we want. And the two inputs are receiving the signal from the, photo the photodiodes here, where we are uh, obtaining the bit note between the two optical waves. So the, the frequency will be the difference between the two waves. And in the end, what we have is, of course, depending on what you send to the AUM, because if you change the spectrum on the AUM, you change the spectrum on the um, optical. But if you send a pure sine wave at something like 70 megahertz to the modulator, you receive on the two inputs two noisy sine waves. Uh, the one which is not going through the crystal is the blue one, and the one which is going through the crystal is a bit attenuated because there is still absorption. And also it is defaced by the, by the hole we burned. And this here is exactly the thing that we will want to measure with the FPGA and the computer. So on the hardware side, we are using Etus USRP 300 with a basic TX and two LFRX uh, daughter boards. And on the software side, of course, uh, new radio library with Python uh, 2.7 and PyQt4. We split the work in three different files because we want to have a flow graph which has been first designed uh, using the GRC and then modified directly in the Python code, uh, which is <coughs> looping, turning constantly. Uh, by default with zero values. We have an interface uh, a GUI file and a third Python file which is basically um, enabling talking between the two files so you can change values in the interface and they will be applied to the flow graph and you can also uh, trigger different kind of actions in order to, to, to do the actual measurement. So I'll talk a bit more about the flow graph. Uh, on the IOM signal generation part, the first thing we have is a vector source because we want to, to use that as a, sp a spectral description of the signal we are sending. So it's typically 128 points uh, on the vector and uh, 15 kilo uh, samples, sample being vector, so 15 kilo vector per second. And for mostly zeros because we, are, we don't want to put completely a strange shape, but we can put some uh, non-zero values, and that will be the modes we will have in the optical um, light. 
we go to time domain using reverse FFT. And then we have a small block uh, which is called double pass correction. And I have to talk a bit more about the acoustic modulator. We use it in double pass. So this is the input and this is the output of the thing. And basically, the light goes in first through the optical uh, modulator. If you have a pure tone light and a pure tone RF signal applied, you are just shifting the frequency of the light. So you do this once and twice. And so you have just shift the frequency. But if you apply more than one uh, frequency here, which is the thing we usually do, uh, after the first pass, the two lines you obtain are interacting with the two lines here. And so you obtain something which is completely uh, not what you want, not pure uh, two signals. And the solution to that was to, uh, for before sending here, to uh, compute the complex square root of the signal. So everything here is complex uh, numbers because we want to be able to uh, tune the amplitude, but also relative phase of all the components. And this, uh, with that, we managed to have, in the end, two beautiful peaks when we want two peaks. And this signal uh, here is just going to the USRP sync, which is connected to the AOM. So this enables us to make sort of a spectral domain-based uh, arbitrary waveform generator. We can make any kind of spectrum we want, basically uh, in the range of, uh, of a few megahertz uh, around the carrier frequency. We also created a block because we wanted to be able to uh, sweep the frequency from one frequency to, the, to another value uh, and then stop, so not using a sawtooth uh, signal but just doing one uh, sweep like that. So we implemented the small sweep scene block, which is uh, just using uh, com uh, computing the complex uh, sine wave for uh, a given uh, value. And what is important here is that we have two increments. You first have the phase increment, because if you don't change the phase, you are a constant value, which is useless. But then we have a phase increment increment, which is incrementing the phase increment so that the frequency of the signal you generate is also changing. And by uh, calculating the good value for both uh, numbers and also for the duration over which you keep those values, we are able to make any kind of, um, of uh, scan from uh, minus uh, one mega to plus one mega in uh, 10 seconds. So this allows us to, uh, to tune the frequency of the, um, of the light and it's basically arbitrary waveform generator in the time domain. On the reception side, what we want to have is uh, the phase induced by the crystal. So the first thing we do is uh, signal acquisition, and then we go to spectrum domain uh, by FFT, and a division between the two inputs, uh, when you separate the two complex parts, magnitude and phase, gives on the magnitude part the ratio of the two magnitudes, which is the optical absorption of the medium. And on the phase part, you obtain the phase difference between the two inputs, which is the dephasing we want to measure in the end. We go to a spectral domain because we want to be applied to, we want to be able to apply a mask to the signal, which is typically done with another vector source with corresponding peaks with the thing that has been used for generation. And when you multiply, uh, you are basically filtering a signal. So as an example here, on the blue curve is the output of the, the magnitude output of one FFT. So here we apply a single tone to the modulator and we obtain a single tone uh, output. And we are just removing all the noise from here to here by multiplying by a mask, which is zero everywhere except where the peak is. And we can do this like that, but we can also do something like this with uh, two uh, frequencies and um, a mask in a plus one, minus one. So in the end, what we have is that we are able to make any kind of linear combination of, the, of any uh, channels that we are measuring. So here is just making the, this one minus this one afterwards. To obtain the result, we use an integrate block, which is just summing the points. So it's summing a lot of zeros because we apply a lot of zeros and it's uh, keeping only the value corresponding to the frequency we want to, to measure. And in the end, uh, here, so the, the original stream is at two mega samples per second. When you put it in vectors to compute the FFT and the masking, you go to 15 kilo samples per second, but 15 kilo vector per second. And after the integrate block, you are at 15 kilo samples per second, 
uh, each sample containing the linear combination of the information on each, uh, each channel. This, this is typically the kind of signal we obtain. So the absorption, uh, the optical absorption uh, of the medium and the defacing induced. Here there is no, no spectral hose, or there is no induced defacing. And after that, for the magnitude, that's all because we just use it for monitoring to see what is the shape of the, of the spectral hole we have and what is the absorption. But on the phase side, we still want to use that as an error signal so to perform uh, correction. So we compute the correction by using a PI2 uh, controller that we implemented with an infinite impulse response uh, filter with appropriate taps uh, calculated to have uh, this kind of transient function, so with very high gain at uh, low frequency to keep the, the, fre the, laser or the, the frequency of the laser to the frequency of the hole. And the corner frequency here and the unitary gain frequency here are, are completely tunable in the software. And then uh, this is sent to a VCO to obtain a variable uh, frequency signal that is applied to the thing which is driving the offset between two lasers. So it's moving the laser accordingly. And uh, using a selector, we are able to choose between this full correction uh, system or just the sweep synth to move the frequency of the laser uh, in order to measure some uh, scan. So the idea is that the master is uh, not moving, uh, is moving independently on, the, on his side, and we are changing the difference between master and slave to keep the slave in the center of the hole. So it assumes that the hole is more stable than the cavity, which is the case in the end. So this is the interface that has been built to use the, this flow graph and be able to generate different kind of signals. It's a bit messy, but you have different parameters here because you have different kind of actions you want to do. You can, want to, you, you can here uh, decide to burn the hole, so you apply high power to create the spectral pattern in the absorption, and you can probe them to put light inside and see what's the defacing. You can scan them to see what is the shape. And what is interesting here is just to notice that this here is the signal which is coming from the photodiode, so the spectrum, the, the um, FFT calculated uh, of these signals. You see here two beautiful pure uh, tones, and this is the thing which is sent to the AOM, so we, are, we need to calculate an ugly signal in order to have in the end a beautiful signal. We, have, uh, we are able to here change the parameters of the lock, as I said, to optimize the, um, the stability of the laser and we have different uh, monitoring parts to see that everything is going well. One example of what we did using this, uh, this system is the double heterodyne method. So I said that we want to measure the defacing induced by one spectral hole, but we noticed that there, there is some strange noise appearing. So we decided to create a small hole which has big defacing and a big hole which has small defacing that will be used as another reference. That's why we call that double heterodyne because we have two uh, references. And uh, by sending, so this is burned using the sweep synth. So we put the light and scan so that it burns uh, the big uh, structure. And uh, by using a plus one minus one mask, we are then able to uh, use this reference signal uh, to, to use this signal as a reference that will see all the, um, all the same noises as the signal which is going here because there is a thing which is a problem in our case is uh, thermal fluctuation and um, air fluctuation that are creating some phase noise in the light and that you can't really remove. Uh, and also we have two different photodiodes with, with two different paths. So there is a defacing which is variable between those two paths. So if you keep this uh, in, the in the signal in the end, you have some uh, not meaningful signal. And by doing this and removing the phase acquired by this uh, mode to the phase acquired by this mode, we are able to remove this kind of noise. For example, what we see is that if we send only one mode and uh, we put no crystal in the path, so we just put the two photodiodes, we acquire the big note and we send them to the, um, to the uh, FPGA uh, board. You have some uh, long-term fluctuations, so this is time in second and uh, defacing. You have some uh, slow fluctuations that have no uh, meaning in terms of um, frequency stability of the laser. And you would have this kind of signal even if you have a hole and this would be added. 
in double uh, reference mode, we are able to remove all those fluctuations. So that's the, 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 the curve we see here. But we keep the signal, which is something I would say important. And uh, using this kind of, um, of detection scheme, we managed to get some, uh, some stabilization of the laser. So this is, uh, again, a land deviation plot. So it just shows the fractional frequency fluctuation for different averaging time. And what we have here is the, um, the frequency fluctuation of the laser when it's locked to the spectral hole with the double retired line method uh, as measured by uh, the frequency comb. So we see that uh, it's a value. But the important thing is that the, this thing is absolutely not uh, anymore limited by the detection noise of the phase uh, measurement, which is uh, far below here. And it's only limited by other technical problems, such as uh, temperature stabilization of the crystal and uh, vibration, because we have a lot of other things to take into account uh, for the stability of the laser. But the signal processing system is quite optimized for this, uh, at least for this level of, uh, of detection. So to conclude, uh, I would say that uh, we use the, the GNU Radio library uh, with the SDR platform because it allows to make very fast um, prototyping of the signal processing. We could have done everything in an FPGA directly, but it would take forever when you want to change just one small uh, block of signal processing. And that's something we did a lot, uh, changing the, the scheme. And with this uh, frequency multiplexing uh, system, we optimize the detection noise to a level which is not, limitant, uh, not limiting the detection now. And we managed to get some uh, laser stabilization. On the side of the future work that will have to be done, as I said, it's a good, fast prototyping uh, system. However, we are quite limited uh, in the locking bandwidth to uh, tens of hertz, mainly because the of the time which is required to take the information from the uh, FPGA board, process it on the computer, and send it back on the, on the loop. There is a fixed delay uh, and a fixed, uh, fixed, time, a fixed time, which is uh, degrading the bandwidth to something which is not really good. We want to, to stabilize the laser to, uh, with a better bandwidth than that. The typical uh, bandwidth is what we, that we want is, would be more in the range of 100 hertz at least. So we made an attempt at using the RFNOC uh, setup to put some of the signal processing, such as FFT and, and the other uh, parts, on the FPGA directly. Uh, however, we lack a bit of knowledge and time for doing that uh, ourselves. And we have a partner which is uh, friend which is um, good at developing uh, things at, on the FPGA directly. And we choose another kind of board for putting the system on it which is a uh, um, FPGA board developed by a coherent company. And so now we are trying to port our setup on this board and optimizing the different, uh, the position of different um, processing blocks that had to be done. So the FFT typically are, can be done on FPGA, but we have to find everything that can be done as fast as possible and the thing that can be done somewhere else. And using the same, the same, uh, the same setup, we would like to try to use the setup in uh, multiple narrow holes because we are able to burn any kind of spectrum we want and uh, any kind of shape. So the idea would be to use uh, more than one narrow hole and to sum the, the error signal you obtain in order to um, improve the signal to noise ratio of that at the moment when we will be limited again by the detection noise. And with that, I thank you for your attention. But thank you. Um, any question? Thank you for this presentation. Um, could you come back on slide eight, please, with the filtering operation, I think? Yes? Uh, uh, the filtering? Ah, here? Yes, this one. Yes. Uh, I think you told us that you put some zeros outside the line to select uh, the line. That's yes. it? Yes. To filter out the noise. Yes. Um, however, I would like to know how you cope with uh, the spectrum which is outside the point of the FFT. 
between the point, in fact, even if you set to zero the point of the FFT, yes. the spectrum exists and it is not uh, set to zero in this way. Uh, the, the fact is that the spectrum is discretized, so, every, um, so it is set to zero by the mask after, uh, I think, after, if I, if I understand well your question, uh, when you make, you apply the mask, everything which is here, uh, since the spectrum is discretized, we are just not taking into account the information which is contained in each uh, point here. But of course, uh, we are not, I mean, it starts already here, we are discretizing the spectrum, so we don't have the information everywhere in the spectrum, so we can't put it to zero, uh, absolutely. But we are just removing all the information that we have, which is useless. So we have already lost a bit of information, which is, I would say, not, uh, not useful for the detection on the center frequency. So it's lost, but uh, from the information we have, we can remove the thing that we don't need. Thank you. Um, could you go back to the slide with the block diagram of the optical setup? Uh, yeah. This one? Yeah. So I, I'm still like kind of digesting that. But um, okay, what I take from this is that you're, you've got a very linear channel, right? You, you can divide yes. the spectra. So this is very interesting to me. So. Are you exciting the uh, AOM with a single tone, or are you uh, exciting it with like a comp? Uh, it depends on what we are, uh, the detection mode we choose. Yeah. So we are exciting the AOM with uh, the appropriate signal to uh, be able to probe the different holes we burn. So if we have only one hole in the middle, yeah. uh, we put only one single tone. And we choose what we do uh, as hole pattern. So it really depends on the, the kind of... Okay. Um, this, this is very interesting to me because if you have many tones, you get like a large peak to average ratio, right? You can, you, in a sign, you always know like... Yes. But with a lot of tones, you can get like large PAPRs. So this makes it even su more surprising to me that you can just divide the FFTs because that only works if everything is linear. And I guess that optically active crystals are not typically linear. Yes, uh, the idea is that we don't change the power we apply to the AOM in the ah, end. Okay. So uh, we divide the FFT because it's, it's really just making some filtering. We could make things in another order that would be uh, bandpass filtering the signal first yeah. and then dividing the signals and not the FFT. Uh, I mean, but obviously, this is, this is very elegant. So. Since, the, since what is done here is the signal we apply here, uh, the spectrum of the signal here is not uh, changing over time. Of course, the signal is changing over time, but the spectrum is not. So uh, we have a bit of normalization to do to the signal mm -hmm. so that we calibrate what is the optical power in each uh, uh, channel. And we do that uh, once, uh, once sometimes. Before, yeah. And when we do this, we can know what is the number to put on the vector yeah. to have the given uh, optical power. OK, thank you. Other question? No? <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to the final session of today. It's going to be a session with a number of surprises, especially in the schedule. We have extra talks, we have talks changing order. So um, be surprised, be amazed. And welcome, first of all, Tristan Clavery, who will talk to you about uh, law on one security. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. So I am Tristan Clavery, and I will talk to you about uh, some work that we did with my colleague Josie Lopez Esteves on uh, law one security assessment test bench. So, Jose and I are working for the National Cybersecurity Agency of France in the Wireless Security Laboratory. In this laboratory, we are studying uh, security of radio communication protocols. We are also doing some electromagnetic security, like tempest or intentional electromagnetic interferences. And we are also doing signal processing, uh, simulations, measurements. 
Um, as for me, I work specifically on the radio communication protocols part, and specifically radio communication protocols dedicated to the Internet of Things, so IoT. And uh, when we put all those words together uh, and we search on the Internet, there are numerous protocols that are related to the IoT. So this is by no means an exhaustive list, uh, but th those are some uh, words that come often. So today the, the topic of the presentation is LoRaWAN, and this is what we'll talk about. So the presentation is organized as such. So first I will present you what LoRaWAN is, uh, what kind of protocol, its architecture, etc. We'll see uh, what has been done before, especially on the security side of things. And then uh, we'll see uh, the shortcomings of the state of the art, in particular when it comes to tooling and existing test benches. And this is why we created our own test bench that we present today. So we'll see the available hardware and software to work with LoRaWAN on a radio level. Then we'll detail uh, the, the test bench that we used and we validated uh, this experimental setup uh, using several experiments and one that we did is re-implementing uh, an existing attack which is called replay or decrypt and we'll detail everything. So first, what is LoRaWAN? So LoRaWAN, maybe you've heard of it, uh, it's part of the low-power wide area network family, so it's a protocol that is dedicated for uh, small devices, usually sensors, that have um, not much battery, not much power, and which must uh, send data over very long distances, so several kilometers. Uh, the main use of the LoRaWAN network today is smart metering, so sensors just communicate their data humidity, temperature over the LoRa LoRaWAN network. And this data is aggregated by uh, software applications somewhere in the internet. The protocol is specified uh, openly by the LoRa Alliance. So they have a website, you can download the specifications. Uh, everything is open. If you look at uh, what's a LoRaWAN network, uh, it looks like this. So. First, at the bottom, you have end devices, so those are your sensors. They are communicating uh, over the radio with gateways, and gateways are just transmitting the data to servers, or so gateways, they are just interfaces uh, between the radio layer and the IP layer. And there you have a LoRaWAN core network, so you have several elements in a core network. And this network is talking to applications. So when we're talking about a LoRaWAN network, whether it's public or private, we're mentioning a set of gateways which are connected to a LoRaWAN core network. And when we're talking about a LoRaWAN application, it's uh, an application that runs somewhere in the internet and which aggregates data from several sensors. And we have one limitation, which is that one and device uh, belongs to only one application, at least at, on a logical level. So, of course, uh, we're here to talk about radio, so we'll focus on one we can do at the radio layer, so whatever happens between end devices and gateways. If we look at the protocol stack over the radio, so we have something like this. Um, first, we have the LoRa modulation, which is owned by Semtech, and then Almost everything is specified by the LoRaWAN specification. Uh, so we have the, what they call the file layer, which is kind of described, but it has been reverse engineered. Um, and well, they call it file, it's more like a link layer. Uh, and then you have a Mac layer and application layer. So here you put uh, all the data that you want to transmit. And uh, a note uh, regarding bounds. So in Europe, the LoRaWAN network is deployed uh, at 868 megahertz. Uh, recently, there was the addition of the uh, 433 megahertz band. So another thing that we need to know when we're working with LoRaWAN is the difference between uplink and downlink messages. So uh, the modulation is a kind of frequency modulation. 
and this is, this is a real capture, so when we are plotting the instantaneous frequency of two different messages, namely uh, above uh, an uplink message, so from an end device to a gateway, uh, we see that the data is modulated on upshifts, and when we are plotting the instantaneous frequency of a downlink message, so from a gateway to an end device, the data is modulated on downshifts. And if we look uh, from a protocol point of view, uh, what happens when a device wants to send data to an application? The device and the network have a set of preferred security parameters, which are uh, stated here. So this is for LoRaWAN 1.0. It's a bit different in LoRaWAN 1.1, but the idea remains. The device and the network uh, go through a handshake phase. So join request uh, and join accept. After this step, they both derive new security parameters and the data between the device and the application is protecting using those new security parameters. And there, the network is just transferring the data from the device uh, to the application but does not modify it. Uh, so mainly it's smart metering, so the main use is uh, data coming from end devices to the application, but occasionally the application may choose to answer to some, uh, to some messages. Also, the device, uh, if it wants to uh, reconfigure its radio parameters, it will send MAC commands and communicate directly with the network. So uh, now that we've seen a bit what is LoRaWAN and how it works, we'll see uh, the, the state of the art and specifically what was done on a security level. So there have been several attacks. Uh, the first, which, have been, which has been uh, independently reported by several teams, uh, is the desynchronization. Basically, it's how to perform a denial of service between a specific device and the LoRaWAN network, so it affected version 1.0, and it came from a flow in the handshake protocol. Then there is a replay or decrypt attack, so we'll elaborate more on that later. Uh, another interesting result is that gateways can be spoofed by an attacker, so either an attacker implements a gateway to an end device, or a radio gateway, or an attacker implements a gateway to a network, so an IP gateway. There has been a formal analysis of the handshake protocol, so uh, which demonstrated the, the flow in LoRaWAN 1.0. Uh, there have been several studies regarding jamming of LoRaWAN communications. Uh, and another very interesting study is about uh, biasing the random number generation using intentional electromagnetic interferences. So there are studies uh, on that. And there are also uh, some studies which detail how to do bit flips attack on the LoRaWAN network. Uh, two other interesting presentations. So they do not describe new attacks or new theoretical attacks, but they describe existing test benches uh, to play with LoRaWAN at the radio layer. And so there has been those two presentations in the first one. Um, they stated that they are able to sniff messages and replay messages, and they used those two capabilities to first re-implement the desynchronization of devices, so the first attack <coughs> on the table, and uh, they also tried to perform some denial of service on the network. And there is a second platform which we do not have much information, which is able to sniff uh, packets over the air and to dissect them. So when we did the state of the art, uh, we could see that there were lots of attacks that were proposed. Uh, most of them are applicable to the radio layer, but there are uh, only few implementations. And when we are reading the papers, uh, we did not find enough details to assess the exact uh, risks that are posed by uh, each attack, so we do not know exactly what are the preconditions? Is it hard to do? Is it not hard to do? Does it require some specific setup? And so uh, we try to reproduce the attacks in order to have our own idea of it is hard, is it not hard, and is it a risk in a live network or not? And 
there were no uh, details on the experimental setup. So we couldn't, we couldn't reproduce the results. And so we came to the conclusion that we had to re-implement the results if we wanted a, a good view of what is LoRaWAN security today. And this is why we had to build our own platform. And uh, this is what we'll present now. So how do we work with uh, the LoRaWAN protocol on a radio level? So first we have the modulation. It's patented by Semtech. It's a kind of frequency modulation. And uh, basically it depends on two parameters, which are the bandwidth and the spreading factor. Uh, modulation is open. You can find it uh, about anywhere on the internet. But the coding of the file layer was not. Uh, first, when we want to work with the protocol, we are looking at uh, development kits, development boards. And uh, so we looked at hardware LoRaWAN modules. So a uh, hardware LoRaWAN module is just a LoRa transceiver plus a LoRaWAN software implementation. And the interesting thing is that with a development board, we usually have a full hand on the Mac layer of the LoRaWAN protocol, which means that we can put anything on the Mac layer and above. So if we manage to have access to this LoRa Mac layer, we can have a software re-implementation of the LoRaWAN protocol. Now, uh, we also have some uh, projects related to software-defined radio. So we have our first uh, blog post on Myriad RF by Josh Bloom, which presents uh, how to demodulate LoRa signals. Uh, and we also have uh, two reverse engineering work on the, of the file layer and the, the coding of frames, which have been done first by Matt Knight and by Peter Robbins. Uh, those two people have implemented a GNU radio project to demodulate LoRa signals. Uh, however, there is only the one by Peter Robbins, which is complete because uh, not only does the modulation, it also does the decoding of the frames. So we have the, actually, the actual bytes that are transmitted. It has some limitation though, which is that we have to use uh, exactly one block per channel and that a single block can process only uplink transmissions or downlink transmissions, but it can do both at the same time. Now, so those are the kinds of elements that we used in our test bench. So our exact test bench is this one. First, we have a development kit from Microchips. So this development kit is composed of one gateway, one LoRaWAN gateway, and two LoRaWAN end devices. Uh, and there is also a package core network in a Docker container, which we can run on a, on a host computer. And if we put everything together, we have a complete test LoRaWAN network, so a real complete network, which we can provision with uh, devices, which, uh, with applications, and we can see which data is transmitted uh, to which device, how we can answer, etc. So we have a real and live LoRaWAN network to test and experiment with. And if we are communicating directly with the LoRa modes, we are able to talk to the LoRa transceiver, and so we are able to forge our own LoRaWAN messages. Another board that we used is uh, the FiPi, so it's a multi-protocol development board which is made by PyCom. It supports five different IoT networks, which are LoRaWAN, Sigfox, LT, Category M1, uh, Bluetooth Low Energy, and Wi-Fi, so it's very powerful. Uh, the interesting thing is that it runs a MicroPython environment. So when we connect to the board, we have a Python shell. And through the Python shell, we can communicate to the LoRaWAN module. And, uh, well, we can communicate to the LoRa module and to the LoRaWAN stack. And using this Python shell, we are able to implement uh, complex scenarios on the PyCom uh, by using its own hardware. And what's even more interesting is that we have access to internal timers of the PyCom, which means that we can have a precise synchronization by using those internal timers. Uh, 
it's even possible to turn the PyCon, uh, the PyPy into a single channel gateway. And there is an existing script uh, to do that, which you can find on the internet and the documentation. And finally, while well, we used an RTL SDR plus GNU Radio, and especially the GRLRA project from Peter Robbins. So we could uh, use it to capture signal and process them. We could use the GRLRA project to decode LoRa transmissions in real time. Um, and we performed a small modification on the project such that we could listen with one block to both uplink and downlink transmissions. Therefore, with one GRLRA block, we are able to capture a complete handshake. Basically, we used uh, the RTLSDR, GNU Radio, and GRLORA to debug the modules, debug their LoRa one stack, and understand the, their behaviors. Something that we can do with it is implement a multi-channel decoder. So this is a simple LoRa one sniffer. So we have our source, uh, the RTLSDR, at the um, right. We have uh, three different uh, LoRa decoder in parallel. And in the middle, we're doing a channel uh, channelization by hand. So uh, we just don't convert the signal. Uh, basically, the parameters that you see here, bandwidth, spreading factor, uh, and the channels, uh, they're all standardized parameters. But with this flow graph, we capture uh, the majority of handshake occurring in an area. Now, a uh, more complex case study is the replay or decrypt attack. So we'll explain a bit uh, what it is and how it works. So this attack has been published by Avon and Ferreira. Uh, and it has a rather high impact because we are able to partially decrypt some messages and we can replay others. Uh, further, there were no uh, mention of any implementation of this attack, so it's very well theoretically described, but we did not know before this study if we could uh, play it uh, for real, so we, um, we experimented with it and we used it to validate our platform. The idea, so I won't get too detailed, but basically after the handshake process, uh, the messages between the device and the application are protecting using the AES uh, encryption algorithm in the CCM mode. And AES CCM is a very secure uh, uh, mode of encryption because uh, CCM mode has been formally proven. However, its uh, security proof relies on one assumption which is that two different messages must not be encrypted with the same security parameters. And if it happens, then the security proof falls and we have some attacks which we can do. And so the, the idea of the attack is we will uh, play with the handshake process of uh, LoRaWAN connection to force a non reuse in the handshake messages such that security parameters will be reused across two different LoRaWAN sessions. So if we have a security parameters reused, basically we have a key stream reused. And if we look at how the messages are encrypted, so it's uh, messages are XORed with the key stream before being sent. And when two different messages are encrypted under the same key stream, we can XOR them together. So this is called a two time pad attack. And uh, the key stream just XORs itself, so it's zero, and we get the two plain text XORed together. So this is why it's only a partial decryption, it's not an, a full decryption, because we do not have uh, all the information, but if we, knew, if we know some elements about one uh, messages one message or the other, then we can infer more uh, elements about the other. So there are uh, two variants of this attack which are detailed in the paper. In variant A1, we are attacking an end device, so we can partially decrypt uplink messages and we can replay downlink messages. And in uh, variant A2, so it works the same, uh, just we are attacking the core network and uh, the impact is symmetric. So we can partially decrypt downlink messages and we can replay uplink messages. 
here. So uh, here is how the attack uh, is implemented, how it works basically. So we say at the beginning that we have captured a complete session. So we have one join request message from the device to the network, one join accept from the network to the device, and we have a certain number of messages which belong to the sessions. We have captured uplink messages, captured downlink messages. Now uh, imagine that the device wants to reconnect to the network. Here, the attacker will send a corrupted join accept or it will jump the legitimate join accept. Basically, it will prevent the device from uh, completing the handshake with the network. The effect of that is that the device will just try another time and it will try again and again and again. And at some point, the attacker will see that the device tries to attach with a nonce. So here we took uh, Xerox one, two, three, four, but it's random, which is the same nonce that was used in the um, in the in the captured session. And if at this moment the attacker sends the captured join accept message, we have the device which. Um, derives new security parameters, so you think they are new, but, but in fact it derives the same security parameters as for the captured session above. So basically here we've won, and so the device then th sends uplink messages which we can partially decrypt with the, with the messages we've captured, and we can also uh, replay downlink messages that we have previously captured. So the implementation, basically the setup is the following. So we, to, we take every element that we presented before and we put them all together. So we have our complete test LoRaWAN network. Uh, we have an attacker which is uh, implemented by the FiPi. And we have an RTL SDR and GR LoRa which monitor uh, what's happening. And so we can verify that the, the attack is, that everything is going uh, as we predicted. So basically the attack is implemented on the FiPi uh, standalone. So the FiPi first uh, capture a complete session. Then we manually uh, reboot the device that is targeted. And then the FiPi will uh, detect when there is a non reuse and complete the attack. So it takes about 100 lines of MicroPython. And this is the second version because we tried first to implement the attack using uh, software defined radio plus a LoRa mode, uh, but we had synchronization problem and couldn't complete. So overall, uh, with our setup, uh, the attack took several days to complete. So several days with a device trying to join a network every 10 seconds. Uh, it may seem like a long time, but it matches theoretical um, expectations of uh, because it needs on average uh, 2 power 15 messages to uh, reuse a nonce so for the device to encounter a collision so those uh, several days are expected and uh, we uh, chose to power out the gateway because um, we did not want to actively jam the uh, 868 megahertz band so finally, uh, this is another uh, rather interesting result of the project. So we used uh, GR LoRa and the RTLSDR and waterfall diagrams uh, to debug and observe the behavior of LoRaWAN stacks. So th this is uh, these are some things that we noticed. Uh, for the LoRa mode, when we are trying to communicate with it, um, directly and we want to transmit several messages in a row the first message uh, the first message is transmitted at the proper frequency but the next one will be transmitted at the frequency you see there so we we saw our messages disappear and we didn't understood why uh, for the pi pi it's a bit um, we need to be a bit uh, used to it uh, basically, the LoRaWAN stack tends to crash, uh, but the FiPi doesn't tell you. 
so when the stack crashes, uh, the FiPy uh, continues working. You still have a working micropath environment, but the LoRaWAN stack doesn't work. But the FiPy lies. So when you are trying to send a message, it, it will do it will react just like it sent a message for real, just like it tried to connect to a network. But in fact, it does nothing. And so again, we used um, GNU Radio to, to verify this. We also could see some uh, differences of behavior between uh, the two devices when they try to join a network. For example, for joining a network, the FiPi uh, tries in the background and doesn't tell you anything. So if you are trying to manipulate the LoRa part while the FiPi is trying to join a network that doesn't exist, basically you will make the LoRaWAN stack crash. And the LoRa mode, when you try to join a network but it fails, uh, it just says that it couldn't and you have to manually try again. It doesn't do anything behind your back. And for those that are interested, uh, the last two bullet points are for turning the devices into gateways. So, as a conclusion, uh, we tried our best to have a proper state of the art about LoRaWAN security. So if you're interested, go follow the links uh, there in the paper as well. We described a complete test bench with every components uh, and software that we used. Hopefully, uh, we have enough details such that uh, you should be able to re-implement our testing infrastructure uh, on your own laboratory. And uh, we used this setup to debug the behaviors of LoRaWAN stacks. And this combination of software-defined radio and hardware modules was very efficient because we were able to implement complex scenarios uh, in a really short time, really efficiently. Uh, and so it was, a, it was a very interesting project to work on. So now what we could do is optimize the GR LoRa implementation to correct those synchronization problem. We could also try to further implement more attacks, especially uh, attacks regarding intentional electromagnetic interferences. Or we could uh, use the platform to try to develop a detection system about whether there is something happening right now on the LoRaWAN network. Can we detect it or not? And we could also uh, try to develop and share some test vectors to see if uh, the network or devices are uh, susceptible to specific uh, attacks. And we could also uh, use our, our platform to study commercial devices if we wanted to uh, work with uh, real and production devices. Thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? Yeah, th thank you for this presentation. Um, I have a question regarding the standard. So there are apparently a lot of issues with this uh, protocol. Uh, is it possible to amend the standards? And can you do that even if the solution are already deployed? Um, I didn't mention that, but a lot of the issues that have uh, been discussed in previous research have been uh, patched in the version 1.1 of the standard, so it's still under deployment. I don't know if, as an individual, you have the leverage uh, to do such modifications, uh, but actually they worked with security researchers before for th uh, uh, the, the patch, so the, the patch holes. Any more questions? If not, let's uh, thank our speaker again then. And <laughs> okay, our next speaker is Julio Manco, who will talk about multi user, multi armed bandit learning algorithms in IoT. Good afternoon to everybody. And I'm going to present a demo that we are currently working on Central Superlet. Uh, our demo is uh, targets the implementation 
of an IoT of an emulation for an IoT for IoT networks, where we uh, try to evaluate machine learning algorithms. So, this is a picture of uh, our scenario where we have a lot of IoT devices trying to communicate to the gateway. And since we have a lot of IoT devices, uh, it may happen uh, that uh, many of them uh, collide. So, uh, in this scenario, uh, we uh, try to include, uh, let's say, uh, smart IoT devices that can incorporate uh, machine learning algorithms to be able to select a channel, a channel or the best channel for its transmission to the gateway. So we uh, try to be uh, as close as possible to, uh, to an LP1 network, meaning that uh, we use unlicensed bands and try to be close to the LoRa standard. So this is our testbed. Uh, we have uh, some uh, few uh, USRPs, an octocloud, and all of them running in radio. So. Our demo is composed of uh, two main parts, uh, let's say an IoT device and a gateway. Uh, each of them uh, is implemented as a transceiver, which uh, let's say has uh, three parts, three main parts, a, a, a block for the generation of a packet, another one for the detection of a packet, and finally we, uh, we implement a, like a LoRa field layer. So uh, this is how it works for uh, for a, a IoT device. Each time the, the it receives a packet, uh, the field layer, the modulate, and send to the to the to this block uh, the packet detection to to decide if this packet was for uh, was sent for this IoT. So uh, what we try to, to emulate uh, is this scenario where we, uh, you can see uh, with more details how each IoT device transmits a packet and then wait for some time to receive an acknowledgement packet from, from the gateway. And we, you, we of course uh, have a lot of IoT devices trying to communicate uh, to the gateway. And we add some uh, IoTs that can incorporate a new block that uh, introduced this uh, machine learning algorithms. For this case, we uh, implement a UCB algorithm which uh, denotes an upper confident bound uh, banded algorithm that has been studied uh, a lot in the literature where uh, this, uh, this algorithm uh, makes decision after, uh, after a successful packet transmission in a given channel. Let's say that uh, this, this IoT uh, sent several times uh, a packet in a given channel to the gateway, and since, uh, since the transmission is successful, this uh, algorithm takes, takes into account this, uh, this uh, let's say, this uh, ratio of number of successful packets give, uh, given the number of, of trials to, to communicate with a gateway to uh, keep trying on this channel. Otherwise, it will try to move or explore uh, different channels. And this is our multi-user uh, scenario. So uh, each time uh, an IoT device trying to, tram trying to transmit a packet, it waits for an acknowledgment. And after it receives an acknowledgment, it again uh, trying to transmit a, a packet and wait for an acknowledgement. This, uh, this procedure is repeated several times to emulate the behavior that we have in an IoT network where you know uh, each IoT device uh, tries to send a packet but after many hours. So here we somehow we force uh, IoT device to, to transmit uh, after this period of time. However, uh, for those IoT devices that can incorporate uh, these learning algorithms, after receiving an acknowledgement, 
uh, each of these IoT will uh, update uh, this uh, learning algorithm to, the, to make a decision on the channel, on which channel to transmit for the next transmission. And of course, each time, uh, each time an IoT device uh, sends a packet to the gateway, it needs to be identified by an ID, like, uh, like a MAC, uh, MAC address. So <coughs> this is the packet structure that we uh, consider for, for this implementation. We have a first a preamble for timing and uh, phase compensation between the the transmissions, and then we have uh, another packet that we named uh, up and down preamble. That uh, in this case it was necessary, uh, it was uh, mandatory to do because we implement a transceiver that send a packet and at the same time is listening on, uh, in the same channel. So it means that every time that an IoT device transmit a packet, it receives. Oh, it hears its own packet, so he can understand that uh, after sending a packet, uh, he receives his own packet and he may consider this packet as an acknowledgement, which is not the case. So for this reason, we, we introduce a, a preamble to, dis to distinguish if, if it is an, an uplink or a downlink packet. So when an IoT device transmits a packet, uh, this flag will uh, allow this IoT device to recognize that this packet is an uplink packet, and of course, uh, you have to discard to uh, avoid this packet to, to be considered as an acknowledgement. After this preamble, we have uh, an ID, which uh, in this case re re means the, let's say the, the MAC address of uh, our IoT device. And since we have uh, six blocks, uh, it, it can uh, incorporate up to 64 uh, IoT users. And of course, we, we, can, con uh, we can divide in, in, uh, in blocks of the smaller samples to take into account a, a large number of IoTs. This is uh, some of the parameters that we set for a lot of standard. This is uh, the problem that we address uh, by implementing uh, this transceiver. Since each time uh, an IoT device or a gateway transmit a packet, it receives his, his own packet. So uh, with this preamble, it can identify and discard the uh, to avoid this, uh, this problem. We also uh, build a graphical, uh, graphical interface to see how it works. Here we have a, a, a graphical interface for an IoT device where uh, in, this, in this picture, in this block, we see two blocks. The first, one, the first uh, block corresponds to the transmitted packet and the second one is the, the block that corresponds to the an acknowledgement that has been received. So in this spectrogram, we, we see that after transmitting a packet, we receive an acknowledgement. And then in this, uh, in this block, we uh, show the statistics about the successful packet transmission. In this case, we have considered uh, four channels so uh, each time that this IoT device tries to transmit a packet in any of these uh, four channels, we, we see that uh, if, if, uh, this transmission uh, were successful. In blue, we have the number of times that the IoT tries to, to transmit a packet in this channel, while in red, we have the number of successful packet transmissions. So if we see a, a gap between these two cores, it's because uh, this packet has been lost or has been not detected either at the gateway or at the IoT site. And the same for the gateway. We also 
thank you thank you account this uh, graphical uh, user interface to to see or uh, do uh, some kind of debugging about the uh, the transmission and the reception of packets and the idea is that as we increase the number of iot devices we we uh, we have to consider that uh, many collisions in different situations uh, may uh, may happen. For instance, when uh, when we have uh, many IOTs that send this uh, the same, at the same time uh, packets uh, in the same channel, or when uh, one of the IOT device send a packet and suddenly uh, there is a, a, an acknowledgement packet. So there, there can be a collision between uplink packets and between uplink and downlink. And all of these collisions degrade the performance, uh, either in terms of the throughput or the, or the energy efficiency. But that's what we want to, to emulate to, to see uh, how these uh, machine learning algorithms uh, can work uh, in a more realistic environment. Here, and I print some videos. I think. I hope. I, since I, I was unable to bring uh, my USRP, so I tried to to show you uh, uh, some figures on on short videos the, about how it, how it works. You can see uh, how the uh, transmission of packet and a resection is is plot in this in this box here uh, takes into account the, the statistics in this block uh, we show the the modulated uh, QPSK symbols and the same for the gateway so in this case uh, there is uh, only uh, one uh, IOT device uh, trying to communicate with a gateway but of course, it can deal with uh, many IOTs. So here we uh, we run these uh, two uh, GRC designs, one in an IOT device and the other one in, a, in for the gateway. And we see that uh, the IOT transmit the packet, and almost at the same time, the, this packet is received by the gateway. Then the gateway recognizes this, this ID for this, I, for this IoT device and send an acknowledgement that is received by this IoT. And of course, uh, he will take into account here the statistics that uh, later will be used by a block uh, where we implement our machine learning algorithm to, to decide uh, on the channel for the next transmission. This is uh, our. Uh, main components in our uh, Gini radio design. We have a block we call the generator IT, IoT to create these packets, another one for the detection of packets, and this block that we name renormalization to, uh, to implement uh, our physical layer. Here uh, you can see it in more details, but if you see that uh, there are many blocks, uh, this block just corresponds to, to take into account the statistics and to do some, de some debugging in, in, in this demo. Here in, the, in these blocks with these dashed lines, you can see that for this IoT, the receiver and the transmitter uh, chain of uh, blocks since we uh, we put uh, a transceiver in each IoT device, and uh, regarding the the machine learning algorithms, it is implemented within this block that we call generator. So each time that it creates a packet, it updates the statistics the statistics about the successful packet transmission in this channel to to the, to decide in which channel to transmit. This is the, these are the blocks for corresponding for the gateway. You, see, uh, you may see that uh, it's, it's quite uh, similar. We, in fact, we use the same block for the physical layer. Somehow the same, the same block for the packet detection 
and the only block that chain is the corresponding to the send ACK, which uh, tries to uh, create a packet for the, uh, the acknowledgement. Here is the, uh, something similar to the previous slide. And this is how it, uh, it works in real time. Let's say that we have uh, just one IoT device and a gateway. So our demo starts by generating a packet in this block, after which this packet is received by the gateway. The, our gateway demodulates uh, this packet in, uh, within this block as a physical layer. And then this block is, uh, this block that brings an ID is detected in this in this uh, section. So here, what uh, the gateway is, uh, tries to do is uh, detect the, the ID of the uh, of the IoT device, and then it sends the acknowledgement. After that, it is this acknowledgement receiver and is detected by the IoT. At this point, the our cycle for uh, in our demo is repeated again. Here, for instance, we have uh, um, two IoTs. One of them is using this channel, let's say the channel uh, given by this in index number seven, and another one that may have, uh, that can use a uh, four channels, let's say uh, channel three, five, seven, and, and nine. So if, if we run uh, this, <laughs> these two IOTs, you will see that uh, as uh, many, uh, many transmissions are carried out, uh, this IOT device that incorporates the machine learning algorithm try to move to the, to the other channel instead of choosing the channel number seven where this first IoT device is transmitting. And of course, uh, you see in the, spectro in the spectrogram uh, many the, the transmission of, at the same time in the, at the same uh, channel or not of this packet. Here we have uh, similar examples. And what we try to to do is to increase the, the number of IoT devices for which our platform uh, is expected to, 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 to incorporate more, more USRPs to evaluate this, not only with more uh, IoT devices, but also in, including a traffic generator to emulate the channel occupancy given by a, a large number of IoT devices. I think that, is, that these uh, examples are somehow, uh, somehow try to explain uh, the work that we did. And I think that that's all that I need to talk. And if, if you have some questions, I, I will be very grateful. <laughs> Any questions? It's apparently been very good, very clear. <laughs> Thank you. Um, our next speaker will be. Yeah. Okay. I had to look at the schedule with myself. Uh, yeah. Pierre Yves Bourgeois from Femto ST, who will talk about phase noise and digital noise and why it is important for groundbreaking RF applications. I hope you have a good time in this conference and uh, I try to be as fast as possible as we need a beer and a barbecue tonight. <laughs> and we all uh, attend uh, Marcus' talk. So uh, I try to be that fast. I wanted to talk to you today about some phase noise consideration. It's just uh, almost like a tutorial for beginners or newcomers and to have some insight of what's going on behind this strange phase noise stuff and digital noise as well. And the main thing, the first thing we can have a look at 
is uh, th there are some kind of here. Th this is an experiment that's been done with four different kind of uh, uh, measurement devices, and we we can uh, see some kind of differences. And especially in this measurement, in this area, there, there are very uh, kind of discrepancies, a lot of spikes, green spikes here uh, with uh, our developed version. And once we remove the spike, magically uh, both spectrums matches. So this is a bit strange when you buy something like 90 euro euros equipment. So the, uh, the, this motivation uh, in time and frequency metrology and in digital world, especially target, I mean, uh, almost uh, any any kind of stuff, uh, high precision digital method, the fully digital signal analysis, the quantization noise kind of analyzers. So this is all measurement bench, but also some state space controls, the lock amplifier, the DSPLL. Everything we we can have some uh, measurement inside, and also some frequency synthesis and transfer. For example, some millisecond pulse or timing, the SDR, telecom and networks, pulse programming, blah blah blah, and as evidence also uh, fundamental physics. Uh, more in our concern in our lab, I'm more focused on high precision uh, time frequency based on compact uh, single ion trap. YouTube and optical clock. I'm just uh, looking at digital stuff in there. And cavity based optical oscillators. I did build the first French uh, cryogenic sapphire micro resonator oscillator back 15 days ago. And now you can buy it for just, uh, let's say, it's a thousand add on Pluto boards. And we used to build also a. a uh, digital phase noise analyzer. There is the LabCom, which with the company Gorgi Timing, uh, and the, with the Observatory of Besançon, and uh, uh, which targets to disseminate time uh, to their clients uh, under a certified manner. And uh, recently, uh, G, uh, GM and all shows that uh, it's not it, it's not that. Uh, uh, hard to break the to spoof at least the GPS, and also from frequency <coughs> dissemination stuff, and also we have some RT with the CNES, which is the National French Ag uh, Space Agency, and also DJI, which is kind of army, and uh, to 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 have a look at digital oscillation and high frequency stability for space systems. Uh, why the we need uh, stable frequencies? The most straightforward answer for every, everyone is just you want to have a great voice into your mobile phone and you want to be at the right place. This is this two situation. I, I actually, I, I put VLBI example, but it's more likely to be the deep space tracking. Imagine you have a vessel or the space shift, your aircraft, the USS Enterprise, you want to localize into space. And uh, what you need to do is to send an electromagnetic wave and, and wait for the way back. Uh, during that time, which is called the round trip light time, and uh, your uh, ground station oscillator based reference should be stable. And this has been told us just precedingly uh, by Paul. And just Venus is just. Uh, in front of us, it's just the door, next door to us. It takes 144 seconds. So during 144 seconds, you need to really get stable frequency. And to, to, to give you some, some ideas of what frequency stability is, is about today, 10 to the minus 15 frequency deviation. So imagine you have 10 to the minus 15 Hertz deviating from the average. Uh, clock frequency. It represents the measurement of the moon and Earth at just mi uh, 20 micrometers, or a watch that gains or loses a second every 70 million years. Of course, this is not for GPS, but more likely for legal stuff and and uh, uh, yeah, and more uh, uh, fundamental physics. 
the optical clocks and oscillators. Uh, we have an insight by Nicola just recently, so I, I, I will a, a bit fast here. The, the thing is we have a, a very stable cavity which acts as a reference here, and you need to, to, to stabilize a laser onto this cavity so you can, you can interrogate an atom here, and once the atom is, uh, is giving its frequency, uh, you can have some kind of control and transfer uh, the clock signal into RF domain thanks to optical combs. Uh, just an optical combs is just a, a super optical synthesizer. In our lab, we, we, we try to put digital stuff everywhere, and especially in uh, cavity stabilized lasers. So th this, is, uh, th th this is the basic uh, cavity uh, stabilized lasers. So you have the cavity here, you have the laser there, and you have a fiber link system because sometimes it's not in different rooms or it's not in different places, so you need to have fiber links that are uh, active uh, compensated with uh, uh, at least Doppler active compensation. And uh, once we explode those two, those two things there, there's a, a bunch of uh, digital stuff here uh, which is re ma make really things of SDR things, except and uh, but also the PID controllers everywhere, and so so it uses our developed ecosystem. I uh, give uh, just a word in a sec, and we use any web server. We have pretty good results, and we raised favorably against a, the analog counterpart. So it's 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 almost the same. But it's uh, very more convenient, of course. So we use uh, we can use a, we a web server to to with Remy uh, to act on uh, on on some some constants and, and uh, act on the uh, uh, DDS uh, stuff. And we have a look at the results with uh, GNU Radio uh, by passing the data through uh, ZMQ. So the problematic was to develop uh, an ecosystem, a solution. Uh, to fit our needs back uh, 2013. So we have mainly uh, this uh, ecosystem we have chosen. Uh, Arctic-based ecosystem, which is based bits from generation from Python. I, I won't go that much into details, just for your convenience here. Our FNAC system more dedicated to it as research with new radio and uh, firmware within the USRP. Purple is a German guy uh, who's, uh, who's add some abstraction layer on platform based on RedPitaya, uh, of course. And uh, our ex ecosystem we just released uh, soon with some interfaces, normalization drivers, and uh, all the toolkits uh, for different kind of, uh, of platforms. Uh, you just have to, it's been just released uh, late uh, end 2018, so you can uh, uh, have a look at uh, DuckDuckKit on GitHub with uh, Asim. And uh, uh, for now, the supported uh, uh, compatible platforms, I mean, are the Red Pitaya, the Adam Pluto boards. It was partial up to yesterday, actually, and now it's full. So it is <laughs> thanks to Gwen again. <laughs> and uh, the hardware compatibility is also uh, correct with uh, ZC706, which is the big, uh, the big uh, zinc. And uh, the USRP X310, uh, we have it. Uh, and B210, but it's almost like a dead end with the USRP310. And uh, yes, different kind of platforms, blah, blah, blah. We, uh, just this slide, just to show you that uh, digital is not always the right solution, so you have to very be careful on choosing the right solution here. It's just I want to show you that the learning curve is discouraging for many people. There is a problem with the locking bandwidth if you want to make locks, and the main problem as well is the quantization noise. And so you have to carefully design your sync so what's noise? Uh, this is a slide I, I show to students, but 
I mean, the first rule is that a perfect signal doesn't exist. It should exist at zero K, but it's impossible, of course. So, uh, so that means actually that it's possible for you to play with devices and transport information and play with uh, information. The second rule is that each time you manipulate the signal, it's, like it's likely getting worse. So each time you filter and add filters and try to add filters, blah, 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 it's going worse and worse. It's easy. You just, you, you just uh, have uh, some engineer, if uh, he has some uh, garbage in or crappy sound in, he cannot do uh, as much uh, and cannot enhance your sound very well. So just the right solution is keep the high, yes, SNR so the signal to noise ratio up to, uh, all the past long. And so the, the uh, not for students now. So the pure monochromatic waves, okay, I said it doesn't exist. Uh, as soon as you have a small atom that is moving, it's just generated thermal noise. And when you have multiple atoms, you had complications. When you had environment, you have also complications. And noise builds up like that. <coughs> Basically, there are three main areas where you can uh, put some kind of noise in there. Everybody knows white noise. White noise is very convenient. We always reason uh, in mass with white noise because you can, you can do whatever and uh, extend in, uh, in the end to other kind of noise, but it does exist other kind of noise. The brain in motion, the joint side noise or thermal noise, all these three are exactly the same, actually. The shot noise, which is a more Poisson low, Poisson low formula uh, phenomena, and the flicker noise. Experimentally, when I say we experimentally verify, that means the old guys verify that these noises phenomena are parametric. They're following uh, slopes. So this is actually very convenient because you just uh, have a different kind of uh, random world, flicker frequency, white frequency, flicker phase, and white phase noise. This is the power spectral density of phase noise. Back to basics a bit. What, how, how can I uh, write noise easily? Uh, you can imagine your friend on representation with your phaser. Just take your phaser and make it shaking uh, all the way up and down. Uh, going uh, over the circle, down the circle, and shaking a bit. So you had modulations. Basically, this is that. This is the real, the, so the real signal, which is the physical signal. I mean, uh, the one for the oscillator. I mean, you can express it that way. It's really, really simple. And uh, the amplitude is modulated with noise. So you add an extra term here. All these are random variables. And the frequency also is modulated, and the phase as well. As both have the uh, same relation, we can end up having just two components. And knowing that you do, what you want to do is to make perfect signal, remember. Uh, those quantities are really small. So the, as they are really, they are not, uh, it's not like your message is uh, drawn into big amount of noise, no. Noise is really small. Okay, so in the end, uh, uh, amplitude and phase modulation, so these random variables are really small. It's like 15, 10 to the minus 15. So it's just uh, very, very small. But still, we all reckon the modulation scheme. So, what not using the RDR DDC kernel for that? Okay, as the application is just extract information, so a message for any mixed RF signals. For the metrology point of view, this uh, there is no information to extract but noise, or at least the noise is the information you want to extract. Doesn't really matter. This is exactly the same technique. So all you have to do is to take into account uh, the the DUT the device in the test or the, the signal source. Uh, this one is the perfect one. You had some noise, kind of noise, environmental noise, blah, 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 whatever. It just add up. Huh? Uh, you have the sampling, of course, to go to the digital world. So you add also uh, some noises coming from the clock noise, 
internal PLLs, blah, 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 whatever, you just add up, and the DDC kernel here. And for the same, I don't know, I didn't put the, any noise in there, but actually there is. And once you get there, the ADC noise is really important to, have, uh, to take into account, and also the first filtering stage. After, no worries. The problem is that you want to decrease your sample rate and to extract the noise and go lower and lower. The brutal decimation, you take just one over every 10. And what's happened, it's just that the noise quantity remains exactly the same. So you divided the bandwidth, but the level is increasing. The noise level is increasing because just of aliasing. So all these alias, uh, uh, all these uh, aliases are folded back to basement or lower here. Just rule of thumb, you divide by 10 the, the, the bandwidth, you add 10 dB. Okay, so how, uh, how can you turn that into your advantages? It's just you filter before. Filtering before helps uh, getting out the alias uh, uh, stuff. Uh, you just have add a small amount of uh, noise, extra noise, which is due to the imperfection of filter. Actually, uh, in uh, digital signal processing, there are some tricky things that enable you to do the two things at the same time, filtering and decimating, with exactly so the same effects. Let's have a simulation now. So you, can, you can have uh, this noise simulator is part of the Sigma Theta software you can find outline. Uh, this software is meant to, uh, to calculate island deviation of full, uh, many kinds of things. And uh, we're, working out, we're working out to, to do a library uh, to be usable in, inside uh, the, our ecosystem. So just to verify, that uh, it's, uh, the, this rule and sum is correct. You ju we just ran two experiments and we verify clearly that uh, the brutal decimation at 10 dB once you decrease the uh, measurement bandwidth. And uh, this, li li this last slide is just a simulation of a 10 gigahertz uh, uh, cryogenic sapphire oscillator phase noise and uh, see that the proof of this noise simulator that it's, uh, you can have it online enabled to, to show you different kind of slopes. Second, uh, the next problem is that your FFT is linear. So if you want to estimate the noise up to one second, or one hertz, sorry, the same, uh, you need a very, 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 very long FFT calculation. It's so impossible to manage. So you must artificially uh, redistribute the energy uh, logarithmically to interpolate the spectrum and have a clear uh, view of your spectrum there. Yeah, so I want a perfect filter. So the perfect filter, again, doesn't exist. Of course, because the inverse transform of the rectangular function is, of course, the sinus cardinal function is that goes forever and forever to time. And also you are in a digital domain that adds replicas. So what you need to do is to, uh, w to window your, uh, your thing function uh, to, to make it go to zero to pre preserve casual causality. Again, it turns in the well-known uh, Gibbs phenomenon and you, you say, oh, yes, I want a really cool filter with 10,000 coefficient. Yes, but this area, it goes crazy at a certain moment. So this, is, this deserves you. And there are still some ripples there. You want to get rid out. So if you want to get rid out the ripples, okay, you use a Ramos-like mm -hmm. algorithm. Uh, yeah, but uh, here you have a slope that's being softened. So it's always a question of trade-off. You, you won't have the straight answer any time, especially for uh, your first, uh, your, your first uh, stage. So basically, what's, what's the digital phase noise measurement uh, principle? 
is just rather simple once we understood everything. So you have uh, you you just sample a GUT here and you pass through the GDC from there and you just so you have a super phase calculator here. And this phase, from this phase calculator, you estimate the power spectral density. So you calculate the FFT, you do some normalization processes, calculate the power spectrum, and divide by the bandwidth to get the, your, your power spectral density. And once you get there, you have this small area here, the upper uh, decade here, just this part. Then you go through another filter and decimate by 10 again and redo the calculation and goes the preceding decade. And you build up your, your, uh, your spectrum like this because you have reduced each time the measurement bandwidth. So uh, it can go forever, of course, but no, actually no, because you just go to one hertz or point one hertz and that's enough and after you pass to Alan deviation because it's just long term, so it's exactly the same. Finally, you just use frequency stability instead. Of course, uh, within the FPGA, uh, you have to perform some more, some more than this simple uh, thing here because you, once you have the D, pass through the GDC here, you make your arc engine calculation with a cordic or whatever. Uh, uh, so you have this phase, which is going minus b pi. So you have to unwrap it. And once the phase time series and, and unwrapped, you have to remove the slope. And then you have the straight phase time series that you can now uh, estimate uh, uh, with the spectral. And here it's just to show you that you can do cross correlation techniques. And these cross correlation techniques, by just uh, uh, calculating the cross product here, uh, enables you to remove any kind of noise in uh, correlated terms in uh, two arms. But this is not sufficient. This is not sufficient because you can't remove the aid to the converted noise. So all what you have to do is to uh, put a four channel version. This is a bit tricky, but once you calculate the, the, the noise quantities, uh, you can remove the contribution of uh, the A to D converters uh, as soon as you are averaging your cross spectrums. And once you are averaged your cross spectrums, uh, it's it, on uh, one over square root of number of correlation. So it can take a lot of time to calculate and a lot and consume a lot, a lot of data. Let's say the best, uh, one of the best, uh, they are all the same, uh, at the same level actually, because, because of the embedded quartz, which is limiting uh, the, the measurement. So they all start around minus 115 at one hertz. Uh, imagine you have a, a, a very good thing that, that is a, a 40 dB lower uh, at one hertz. You need to integrate six months to have your measurement. This can be a problematic. Another funny thing is that uh, at the first filtering stage here with four channels, so it's IQ channels, you have 428 coefficients in, uh, within the FPGA for the filtering stage, and we calculate 17 tera operation per second. This is quite funny numbers. And of course, we developed that in uh, four years with 10 million people and three lines of code. But we ended up having some QT GUI. I need to go fast because it's less. Uh, so I just wish that we can do funny measurements. Uh, yes, with this formula, just you can calculate the NOB just by measuring the phase noise here, the white phase noise. Okay, my question is, uh, is GNU radio able to to be a measurement analyzer. So let's to verify that. I, I suppose it's, it's not meant to be for as first sight because uh, we need data manipulation, visualization. So let's just verify by a simple example. We consider random noise and add a bit of physical measurement. That means I want 10 volts, blah, blah, blah. And you do the spectral measure you have for this uh, uh, norm R&D or Gaussian noise source, 
a mean equal to zero and a variance equal to one. Oops. I took 250 kilohertz sample rate, and uh, I, 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 we, we did uh, the frequency measurement uh, on 50, 512 FFT here and 8K points, I think. I can't read from there. Okay, but we observed different levels here. Uh, the variance in the mean are, are correct, but the levels are not. Uh, the measurement bandwidth remains the same, so the level should be the same. There is a bit problem here. Doesn't really matter. So this is the octave version. Uh, uh, the octave version, you have the piece of code here. Uh, it's just the calculation of the definition of the PSD. And you have the, the, this result, but you can also use the peri periodogram function that gives you exactly the same result. So no, ma no matter what's that, my, my goal is to have a GNU radio making a phase noise measurement. So, uh, so let's say my objective is measure uh, minus 100 uh, uh, dB rate square per hertz at 10 megahertz, blah, blah, blah. So this is my reference uh, simulation. And uh, what I do here, I just re reproduce the PSD calculation here. I just split uh, uh, here, so I, I take a file source and it's going, I, I know a throttle is not, uh, I'm not very familiar with GNU radio, so I probably do mistakes, but I like this, uh, I like this because uh, there are funny colors. And uh, so this is great. In the end, we have two paths here, the QT uh, vector thing, which is uh, meant to represent the frequency, actually, and uh, uh, in the GSP, and the QT uh, time thing here, uh, just to, to have a, an insight uh, what's going on on time. And it works. It works pretty well. And uh, so all, you, all we need to do now is doing some kind of block or and, uh, and, per and perform the other decades with uh, different uh, uh, decimation and, and so on. So that, that I think it's a great uh, promising tool to do really true me measurements. Thanks a lot. I, I'm, I'm a bit late now. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Hey, does anyone have any questions? Thank you for this very technical presentation. Um, no, you don't want to ask my question? I mean, <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. Yes, I would like to know how you cope with uh, the sampli sampling jitter of your ADC clock. Yeah. The jitter? Of the sampling clock. Uh, it dip ah, uh, the fact that your um, sampling clock is not uh, also a perfect You mean the clock. external synthesizer that is used as a sampling clock for the A2D converter? Yes, that's it. Yeah, okay, it's not the digital of the A2D converter. We usually have a very stable uh, Rackham based uh, um, oscillator, which is based on quartz and with a PLL, and which has this strange limit of minus 115 dB red squared at one hertz, and this is why all commercial device and our as well has this limit at one hertz for the moment. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? If not, let's thank him again. And now for our final talk, we'll take a deep dive into the internals of new radio that makes all this fun stuff possible. Uh, Marcus, do you have your slides already? Uh, should I have prepared slides? Oh, you don't have slides. Oh, that's even better. <laughs> Watch me not care. <laughs> uh, I can't remember where they are. So they're here. Yes, throwing L gate off. Oh yeah. So 
Thank you for being here. I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite honored to, you know, occupy this oversized slot. So um, uh, what I want to apologize for in front is that uh, parts of this talk are going to be a bit um, texty with respect to the slides, which I hope to compensate by talking a lot, which is what I do when I'm nervous. So um, what we're going to talk about today is, oh, well, I, I will have like a 30-second introduction to myself. Um, then we're going to talk about what actually makes up a GNU Radio program. Um, then I'm going to talk about what the architectural idea of GNU Radio is. Um, maybe abstracting a bit, I, I'm, I'm presuming most of you have like at least used GNU Radio because you're kind of here. Um, but we'll have to pick up on a few core concepts. Then we'll look at how things are actually implemented. Then I'm going to do something that I really like to do is like put my finger in open wounds of GNU Radio. So um, we'll have to figure out a lot of challenges and um, that kind of concludes my talk. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a few looks at your faces during the talk and if I see this that I'm a student and I have no idea what's happening here, uh, faces a lot, then I will stop and ask whether you are following me. So please do pretend to be asleep. Um, so uh, who am I? Um, hi, I'm Marcus. Um, so um, I'm a research assistant at CEL, Communications Engineering Lab, at KIT in Karlsruhe, Germany. Um, I've just started doing my PhD, and I have absolutely positively no idea what I'm doing. So um, this is something that I'm not going to talk about very much. I do teach a bit. Um, not really. Like, I do the exercises. So uh, for, um, yeah, probability, like stochastics 101 and uh, comp theory. Uh, and some smaller courses. Um, also, I occasionally earn money um, by freelancing. Um, I've been earning money for some time now with, uh, at Edis helping uh, their customers, kind of my customers does. Um, so if you've got a grumpy reply from some support contractor, um, that have, might have been me. Um, also, and that might kind of be the point why I'm here is I maintain a radio project, which basically means that instead of actually coming to terms with myself and writing some code that fixes some stuff, I'm, I'm stuck a lot with like deciding what goes in, what doesn't, and why the line endings have to be different or something like that. I, I don't. Um, so this, this is a newer development for me, and it's um, pretty exciting. And it's, I'm, I'm still totally overwhelmed by the fact that this is a big project that like kind of people from all over Europe come here and I'm, I'm thanking everyone who's been involved with the organization um, because, wow. <laughs> so this, this has really been bigger than I, I would have imagined. So um, let's, let's dive into what GNU Radio does. GNU Radio solves a problem. And well, by solving a problem, it, I mean it, it states a problem that it thinks that it's good at and then it solves that problem. That's a very mathematical thing to do. Um, so, um, what is the SDR problem as told by GNU Radio? It's basically, well, you have some hardware, right? That, you know, I happen to have one. I don't know where that came from. You get some samples from the hardware. Um, then you process these samples. And in the end, you typically um, get the data out to hardware. Often that hardware is just like a storage device. Um, or it's like a transmitter or a sound card or whatever. Um, well, we do that, Radio does that with what it considers high rates, which is a relative term, I reckon. Um, because these things, I think, like on the CPU, two mega samples are realistic. Let's put it that way. Um, like, I've just, just as I said, like I've started my PhD, and my professor comes from an optical communications background, and he's like, yeah, I've got this 25 giga samples ADC. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> well, that's not a radio rate. Um, that's not a radio scale. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're not doing that in ASICs. We're doing that on general purpose CPU. So that, that kind of is the central problem there, right? We're not designing specific hardware, because we're in the business of software-defined radio. So what we're doing is use standard PC hardware to actually deal with signals. So from that stems the 
flow graph approach, which kind of emulates the idea of having signal processing steps that you just concatenate. So um, uh, you've probably seen, like you've definitely seen if you've not been asleep during the last six talks or so, um, you've seen a radio flow graph, and this is one that's composed of blocks and it has connections. So um, let's, let's have a closer look at what these blocks, like what the elements are and what the constraints are on them. Well, we have blocks, right? These are the things that actually do signal processing. Um, they take digital samples in. We're in the digital world. Um, they have in and outputs. They can have as many or a little as they want of each. Um, and um, due to logical constraints, an input can feed many outputs, but not the other way around. You can only have one output per input. Um, so um, what you as a, as a radio developer would do is you focus on um, implementing the signal processing. So you go ahead and say, OK, this is my workload. What I want to have is samples, and I'm going to go ahead and give you samples. Um, so Gnurado takes care of, of getting the samples between these blocks exchanged. That's, that's not your job, usually. Um, um, what you'll have to do is write good code. Um, so that, that leaves me with the question, where do I put that code? Um, as, as I said, you put that in a block. What is a block if you really look at it? If you really look at it, a block is actually just a subclass of the C++ class GR block. It's not too exciting. Um, um, it has, like that class has a lot of uh, methods and, and fields, but most importantly, it has the general work method. Um, and the general work method is where you, where you pu put your algorithm. So what does it take? It takes um, four parameters, and I'm gonna go and mentally sort them by importance for, for the person doing the, soft, uh, the signal processing. Well, there is there's the parameter called input items, which is, to a little surprise, your input. It's actually a vector of pointers to the beginning of your input buffers. Why a vector of pointers? Because you might have multiple inputs. So you need some structure to say, okay, this is where the input samples from my first input lay, this is where the second, and so on. Same for the output. So you get some space to put your output. Well, you need to use that because otherwise you're not producing anything. Um, and because this is, um, uh, we need to know how much there is of either. There's a vector of available input items, the number of them. So it says, okay, on input one, there's 100 items. On input two, there's 2,000 items. Um, and we have a single number called n output items, which is basically just the minimum available space on all your outputs. Okay? So this is a very minimalistic interface for someone who's implementing such stream-based processing. Um, if you've worked with uh, tools like uh, Simulink, you will know that you can do a lot more. And if you worked with uh, tools like SCI slash Aussie slash Red Hawk, you've probably gone insane implementing Cobra interfaces by now. So this is really what I consider the reason for Gnurator's uh, success is you've got a work function, all it gets is data and how much there is of that. So um, that's, that's how, how it looks. Um, the other thing that you're obliged to do is tell the radio, okay, you just called me with this and that many input items, gave me this and that out much output space, and I actually made use of that, and I produced so many items by just re returning so many. So um, you just tell the scheduler, and we're gonna have a deeper look into what that is, um, how much you produced. So um, for completeness sake, um, there's a few more things that you need to do, implement if you're just writing a standard block, you need to have a forecast method. Forecast is a bit boring, it's just, yeah, the scheduler goes in and says, okay, um, I want you to produce 200 items of output because that happens to be the space that I have available and I'd like you to do as much work as I, you could, right? So um, how much input would you need for that? And you then go ahead and fill in how much input you'd need. Um, this is like, this is nasty. You don't actually want to implement that, right? That's, that's boring. It's not part of your signal processing. So for the most common case where the number of items you, you're going to produce is equal to the number of items that you're going to take, which is like 
I multiply with a constant. I multiply two streams. I filter something. It's always the same input as output. Yeah, we've got subclasses that kind of, you know, conveniently wrap that so that you don't have to care about that. Um, what's really interesting is, um, is that GenRadio has the ability to let you not do work, not do all work at least. Namely, GenRadio says, hey, I have 2,000 samples um, of input. What do you want to do with that? And you just go ahead and work on that, but it turns out that your algorithm is just designed to work with 1,024 at the time, for example, because whatever, you do a correlation internally with an FFT that you fixed inside. So um, uh, you tell the scheduler, hey, I produced only 1,024. And because you're a synchronous block, it knows that that means you've consumed only 1,024. Okay, that leaves us with 954 uh, uh, items, uh, sorry, with, with a lot of items that we didn't consume. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, and GreenRadio is pretty clever about that. GreenRadio just preserves these items. In fact, it leaves them where they are, just remembers to not mark them as consumed yet. So next time you've, you're going to be called, these are going to be, which used to be like the end of what you were presented with as work, is going to be the beginning. So, well, this is your input, this is what you consumed, this is what you've left for the next time, and that's what you presented next time. So this is pretty handy, um, but it comes with a few uh, architectural consequences that we're going to talk about in a minute. But first, um, let's, let's talk about how um, we come from blocks to graphs. So, as I said, Gnuredo has this flow graph idea. And that flow graph idea is really like a mathematically defined directed graph. So, um, what's happening there is Gnuredo has classes that you can tell, hey, these are two blocks. They do processing. One produces data, the other consumes it and produces no new data. And you can connect them. So that's pretty simple, pretty intuitive. You just say, hey, the top block, I want to connect that signal source to that filter. And from both, please take the uh, zeroest output and the zeroest input, which happens to be the only ones they have, and then connect the next thing in line. So that, that gives GNURADIO a definition of a graph, actually as edges between nodes. So that's, that's an abstract representation. Um, that GNURADIO keeps until you actually do something with that flow graph. Um, and what does that mean, actually doing something with the flow graph? Um, that means you say, hey, top lock, go ahead, do your thing. <coughs> and yeah, that happens. So GNURADIO goes ahead and analyzes that graph. First of all, it looks at all the blocks in there. These blocks, they define, hey, I'm producing floats for example, because, well, I'm a real value processing block. So I tell, um, I have a property that says, my output signature is composed of single items of size four, because floats on most machines happen to be 32 bits, so four bytes. Um, and GNURADO checks that. GNURADO <coughs> tries then to um, realize all the constraints given by these blocks, which are basically sizes of input items, also output multiples and things, but uh, mostly that it looks at whether these item sizes are compatible, and then says, okay, that's nice, let's allocate a buffer that is a multiple of that size. Okay, well, that doesn't tell us much. We only just learned that um, <coughs> this means that this arrow here is actually a buffer. Okay, and we know that that buffer is going to be a multiple of four bytes in size because four bytes is the size of a single item. Um, uh, so um, the moment that happened, we've got uh, buffers representing all the connections in the block. Um, whereby I must mention that basically every output connection is a buffer. So in my example, I had like this block that has like that had one output that go, went into two inputs, that's one buffer. But it has two readers. We, we're going to look at that in a second. Um, 
And what it also does, and that's the title of this talk, is it starts um, setting up a scheduling system. And that basically means, okay, um, there's a threat. So um, for those not uh, too much into um, uh, software design on, on multi-core machines, a threat is simply a thing that can run concurrently or one at a time and is scheduled by the operating system to run on a CPU core. So that's basically all your processes are at least one thread um, that does some work. So um, Ignore Radio Flow Graph ends up with like a single thread for every block that you used. They don't do anything, they're in an idle state, they wait. Um, they don't get scheduled by the operating system so far. Um, what's then happening is that it goes sequentially through all the blocks and tells them, hey, could you, you know, start up, prepare for working? That's basically, that's an optional step, but you know, your user P source might want to open that USB transport now, or your audio source needs to talk to someone um, to actually get like a handle to the, to the audio subsystem. So that's what's happening there. Um, then Generator does something um, that's pretty important to the whole causality aspect of things. It basically asks around, hey, who of you is actually ready to work? Because we've got a small problem here. Um, right? This guy can't, can't do anything because it doesn't have any input data yet. The same for these. What should they consume at the start of everything? No one con produced any data, so there's nothing to be written to this. There's nothing to be displayed anywhere. So the only block whose forecast is going to tell you, yeah, to produce 2,000 items of output, I need exactly zero input, is a source in our uh, flow graph. So after asking around, Pinradio realizes, okay, this is a source. I'm going to schedule that one first. Like, I'm going to start that one uh, first. And what then happens is, uh, will not surprise you to be a bit clickbaity here. Um, so let's skip that. Um, uh, let's not skip that. Let's postpone that. <laughs> um, so um, what happens then is that the source block gets notified. Yeah? And that happened because we already asked this, the forecast method, whether it's ready to produce. It has an empty output buffer. Completely empty. So it's asked to produce up to half of that output buffer's uh, size. Why half? Be with me. That's interesting. Um, so what then happens is, how, how is it asked? Yeah, actually, the general work function is called. So it actually goes, goes, yeah, goes to town and starts DSP. Um, and in our case of our example, the signal source is going to produce samples of a cosine. It's not too exciting, but you know, it just fills the output buffer, or the half of the output buffer that's been offered with these samples. Then it returns, OK, I actually produced as many samples as you asked me. Fine, says the block executor. Um, that means that something has changed in the vicinity, in the environment of that block. I'm going to notify the adjacent blocks in my graph. So what happens now is that we have the, the, the downstream block connected to that source, that now gets informed that something has changed. That block now looks, the executor looks at the available input item, says, aha, this has changed. Goes ahead and asks, hey, you have half the output buffer of uh, freedom to produce. You have that much, like, can you produce with that? The next block says, hey, I'm a sync block. I need as much input as I'm going to produce output. The block realizes, hey, it just gotten half an input buffer. That is enough, because it's exactly the number of items it's going to produce. So it kicks off the thing. So now comes the interesting part. All the blocks have their own threads, which means that in the situation where, now let's, let's look at this, where this one is actually producing the first bunch of items that that one produced the source can start working again. So now we have already par achieved parallelism without having put any thought into that. So that's, that's really, really cheap. So 
The multiply const is presumably a bit faster than the signal source. So while the signal source is still in its second run, the multiply const finishes its first run. So the file sync is notified. The file sync starts consuming these items, starts its own work function, and um, consumes these items. Now, obviously, files like storage is usually a really slow process. Like, um, we've heard that you know, that can re really put a, put a limit on things. And um, so it's pretty certain that the file sync is going to take longer to finish than the, the other blocks to work. So while this thing is actually still working, um, the multiply cons might be asked to do like a second run, which still works because half the output buffer is still free. So that's the reason why we're doing half the output buffer, so that there's a guarantee that a reasonably well-behaved block can work in parallel to its predecessor. Um, uh, yeah, well, that might work, but then we've completely filled the output buffer, right? So we can't go ahead. Because the file sync has not yet returned anything, so Gnoradio knows, okay, all the items there on the input buffer of the file sync are still being used. We can't overwrite them with new output. So that's why I call Gnoradio a back pressure driven architecture. Basically, there's always some um, bottleneck in there and it ripples down. So uh, in this case, the only bottleneck would be the file sync probably in uh, Paul's flow graphs that, that it might have been some resamplers or some filters or uh, filter banks um, or clock synchronizers, whatever. Um, and then it ripples down, meaning upstream, because buffers are full, can't be used. And of course, as long as I don't produce anything, the downstream blocks get starved, so they don't get any input, they are not called. So um, that's, that's fine. Um, but, um, so what does that come with? Well, that comes with the realization that saying Gnoradio has a scheduler might be a bit of an overstatement. Actually, who's doing the uh, um, scheduling? That's the operating system. The operating system is in charge of, you know, I notify five threads. Who do I wake up first, given that I only have four CPU cores? The OS decides that. That comes with a high burden. Well, it comes with a high down, large downside because the OS doesn't know anything about our data. The OS knows that I've asked it to start, like notify one of these threads. So it might be saying, okay, nice, I have this CPU core over there. Go and run there. Problem? Let's say we have two CPU cores. Now four CPU cores. The, the zeros, or the first one might be executing the signal source, the second one might be then starting the, the multiply conf, the third one might be the file sync. Is that an optimal solution? Probably not so much, because if you're a bit into uh, general uh, purpose computing, you might know that memory is really rather slow compared to computation. So a multiplication with a constant will take a fraction of the time it would get to like take to actually fill a CPU uh, cache from main RAM. So what's really desirable would be that, well, the signal source and the multiply cons basically run on the same CPU core, because that would take the, I need to keep the data consistent across multiple CPU caches problem away. It would reduce the potential for parallelism, but let's be honest here, very few radio flow graphs are as simple as that. Most more look like the, yeah, like, like Paul, Paul's flow graph, not like Paul. It, that would be awesome. <laughs> um, um, so that, that, um, that is something that we need to work with. Um, another thing that this, this flow graph architecture really represents very badly is the fact that not everything is a stream. Um, like, the reason people invented, like, why was Gnoradio founded? That was because someone was set up, uh, like, a li little bit 
let's say, angry about the mo uh, Moving Picture uh, Association of America, who introduced a copy protection flag into the ATSC standard. And he, they were like, this is a safe po copy protection. We should be like, forcing this on every citizen. And Eric was like, um, yeah, you know, I can go in with SCR and just flip that bit. Um, it's A, not effective, and B, it's like restricting people's freedom. So uh, um, Ray was actually founded that way. So that, that was the background that we come from. High rate, for, for that time, high rate stream processing. But where is Gnarelli in use now? It's used in like physical experiments. I've, like one of the standard um, physicists support request email to Atos is, hey, how do I start a, um, a sampling on an external signal? Because that's what physicists do. They observe things that typically are finite in length. Um, so that's, that's a very common problem. What's also used for is obviously packetized communications. So one of the, let's say, most popular um, modules for GNU/RADIO is the I GRIEEE 802.11 module, um, um, which implements Wi-Fi, basically. But it does so badly. Why? Well, it's hard to do low latency communications with an external device to a CPU. That's one thing. But if you look at the whole buffers in between here, and I said, like, by default, Everyone in here is asked to produce half an output buffer. That's a nice recipe to maximize throughput because then you can, you know, your algorithm can go in and work on sequential memory. But it's not a good recipe to keep latency in check. So um, that's, that's another downside. Then, um, as I said, not everything is a stream. Also, not everything that's relevant to you might be sample data. You might want to say, hey, you know what? This looks like a correlation with my preamble. This is the start of my packet. Please, uh, downstream, please analyze the data stream with respect to that point in time. And um, so you need to annotate your, um, your data stream a bit. Um, um, so you can do that with tagging. Uh, we, we got these stream tags. and. Um, this is where I go into how, how that's implemented is basically there's a container that contains all the stream tags that are alive right now and you're presented with a view of these. And um, that's, that's what you do when you need samples, uh, text regarding to your samples that you're working now on. Working now. You ask a function called get text and range, which is nice, but it comes with a computational overhead because you know, there are structures inside that need to be updated with the info, which tags exist on which connection for which samples. And things get really, really hairy as soon as you resample. And they get impossible to solve as soon as you have something that's not like a fixed input to output rate because then your tag doesn't have a definite position relative to time or to sampling time. So um, this, this is a bit harder to get right um, than, let's say, stream processing. Um, another shortcoming that we have is, um, or no, another shortcoming of the, um, of the uh, stream-based processing problem is, uh, what, what if you know, we need some kind of feedback? Everyone knows that you know, channel estimation should probably go somewhere, yeah, modify the state of someone else. And um, that, that, that's not happening here because all we can do is like send data downstream. We can never go back or sidewards. Um, and people have like in the past come up with fantastic methods of solving that. They basically said, you know, I can just take a C struct call, yeah, call, call, that, call that an item and push that around. And it's, um, pretty terrible because it's all in line and it doesn't solve the core problem, namely that you can't have feedback. So um, this, is, this is something that I sadly in 2019 still need to show, is that GNRADIO is too stupid to actually do an IRR, a single tap IRR at that. So um, this, this is, I mean, this obviously doesn't work because the add function can't add two numbers 
if there's only one input that can possibly have input items already at the beginning. But we could invent some method of saying, okay, there's a second input. We're just not there yet. So this doesn't work. So how, how do we do feedback? Well, we have a second kind of streams, and um, this is, um, these are a bit special. These are not actually streams with data samples. They're actually just messages that get sent from one to another block. And they get handled. But how do they get handled? Well, it would be not a good idea if, for example, my channel estimator was updating for some fur filter tabs while that fur filter was still in operation. Especially if that changes the length of the tab vector because, you know, um, memory happiness and shows. Um, so, uh, what, was uh, what was decided was that we added a step, a special step in that scheduling loop where we said, okay, I'm waiting for, in for, for something to change in my environment, or I get notified, I realize I can actually do work, I do that work. We added a step, check where there's messages arrived. So that's always kind of thread safe because it runs, never runs at the same time as the work function, but it's also a hassle because that was bolted on in 2010, I think. Yeah, um, and we ha we've had like special edge case problems with that because now we've got like a system that really is based on a graph mathematically strictly defined graph that can't have cycles. And thus, it's really clear how you shut down something. If something is done, you just tell everyone upstream, sorry, you can't do anything. And everything downstream just finishes doing what it's doing, and then it's done. Um, to something that doesn't have a clear quitting option. There's no exit option there. So um, this is a disaster. Like architecturally, we broke up a clean design and made it useful. Um, that's what people kind of do, but yeah. So this is, this is um, one of the core problems that we're facing right now, how to properly do um, a kind of asynchronous system that still applies to a very strictly defined flow graph. So, um, Another thing that I mentioned a lot was there's input-output buffers. And I also said, actually, there's only output buffers. And, and how that looks like is, OK, every block has its output buffer or buffers. Um, um, and every input, yeah, it just reads from that. So there's a small, and, and also I said that like, memory is contiguous. So I always, I'm always presented with, um, hey, here's your work. Here's sample 0 to. Uh, 20,000, whatever, they lie in memory and lie right next after each other. That can only work under one of two options. First of all, um, I have infinite memory, which is um, not even fine if you're a theoretical computer scientist. Um, or you kind of start switching out buffers and, you know, the items that are left over from last call getting copied in first, then I, nah. Copying data is always a bad choice, computationally wise, because I'm blocking memory bandwidth with that, and that's very often the limiting factor. So um, what can radio does instead? It's ring buffers. Ring buffers are, well, they're probably one of the first inventions of computer science was like, how do I put something in there to sequentially use it? And it's pretty simple. If you've got like a this P core, like a digital signal processor, as in silicon, then that will have a uh, address generation unit, and that unit can just do, you know, you give it an address, and it maps it internally to like some modulo size thing, and it works in rounds. That's cool. That works on the whatever DSP 86K from the 1980s. Um, not so much on the x86. So not so much on ARM. So. Um, this, this is really cool in theory, right? I can just push in samples, and my consumer just takes out samples, and all I have to do is, you know, watch that when producing more samples, I don't, like, reach where I still read, and when reading, I don't overtake what I write. So that's the only two things I have to watch for. Really cool in theory, in practice, um, 
sadly not really implementable on, on commodity hardware. So what Gradle does instead um, is, yeah, we kind of abuse the fact that, uh, you know, PCs and generally modern CPUs have the feature to map memory. That has a very simple reason, and the reason being is these things have a lot of uh, RAM and multiple programs that should not know of each other's memory. So what's happening is that a computer usually has different kind of addresses, and it has physical addresses, typically an intermediate linear representation of that address space so that your, C whatever, your PC has 16 gigabytes of looking like it's linear memory, and then it got, for every process, its own memory space. So and what's happening is that the operating system takes some page, some for kilobyte page modern mostly, and just says, okay, dear my, uh, memory management unit, here's a translation table. When the process asks you for address zero, that's where it goes in actual memory. So that's how it maps memory from actual RAM chips to what your program sees. So different programs see different things at the same address. And, and that's the cool thing, <coughs> technically that allows you to take the same physical piece of memory, four kilobyte piece of memory, and map it to different positions. And exactly that's what Gnurator does. It says, okay, for example, I need an eight kilobyte buffer. And I take two pages and I just put them right after each other. So if my workload items happens to be at the end of page one and the new ones are at the beginning of page zero, that doesn't look like it's two different th things. They just look like they're in series, right? So that's really cool, but it comes with two main downsides. First of all, I mentioned the, the, the granularity. That's four kilobyte pages or more. There's really no option to go smaller on most systems. So um, that means that my buffers need to be both a multiple of four kilobytes and of the item size which is not a problem unless you decide that you know, your output items are 113 bytes in size because, well, that's get, get, that gets larger. But honestly, it's not that much of a problem because RAM is cheap. What's not cheap um, is the fact that, well, to be able to freely map memory, you need, you know, your memory needs to be specially handled by the operating system. Normally, your operating system is in charge of mapping memory somewhere. And you can't do that as a program unless you're kind of a driver or something. So the trick is you ask for shared memory, which is used usually to ex communicate between different processes, and this is kind of fitting that description, actually. Um, but shared memory can't come from a hardware driver because there's no way of you know, enforcing that all hardware drivers adhere to the contracts that shared memory should have. So now we're stuck. Either we can have this nice... Um, so do circular buffer, or we can have memory that's di directly mapped to your GPU, which would be awesome because maybe your GPU is running CUDA and it's running a FFT on the, on the, uh, on the uh, GPU, accelerating your whole thing, but instead you need to like, have a block that just copies, really stupidly copies memory from its input buffer to some uh, GPU buffer, and then from the GPU buffer to an output buffer. That's two memory accesses that you'd really want to avoid in that situation. Even more so if you consider that, you know, high-rate data processing often gets samples from network links. Um, so your network card's actually able to put memory, like data, incoming data, where you ask it to. Which is awesome, but Gnurator can't use it. So that's the second thing that we need to change. So, um, yeah, that. Uh, I <laughs> yeah, let's, let's roll with that. Are there any questions here? <laughs> I see you're ready for the barbecue, so that's, that's actually pretty fine with me. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, to, <laughs> to, yeah, to, to conclude this, okay, Gnurayu has had 18 years of history, which means that a lot of the environmental uh, things have changed. Um, you know, 
there weren't any um, signal, uh, any message passing, asynchronous message passing when Green Radio was invented. There weren't any stream tags. There was no need to put Green Radio on an embedded device. There was no need to accelerate Green Radio with a graphics card because, well, that didn't exist back in the day. So, um, and it would be a lie if I said that every decision that we made on the way was a good one. Um, uh, but, well, we are in a kind of an interesting time right now because um, the, the, the fact is that big money actually comes from big rates. Uh, so um, if people look into, oh, where do I put my corporate money when developing SDR hardware or SDR software, they will typically look into a market that says, okay, we can sell new devices, and that's not happening at a few mega samples, that's happening at a lot of mega samples. And these people would probably want an SDR system that, you know, supports accelerators. Um, so uh, that's, that's an interesting time, and I actually, I'm pretty confident that we'll sort this out, because um, first of all, I'm always pretty confident. Uh, when I'm not nervous. Um, and, and second, um, at last GRCon and previous GRCons, we actually had pretty productive talks with people that actually are in the business of building accelerators or building network cards or building higher rate uh, data acquisition devices. So um, that, that, that is happening. It's not just happening in like the coming release. So um, I already said all this. Um, so what, what could we do in the near future? What we could do is move away from the I notify everyone when something has changed thing. Instead, and have stream tag separate from, from data and have messages be something completely different than sample data. What we could do is have workload items. Yeah, a workload item is basically the information, hey, this is the function that's gonna be called, this is the data that's going in there, and this is the output space that I probably want to use. And then let something clever work out where that space comes from, and use something clever to decide who's gonna execute that. And that's, that's the interesting um, thing, is would be much, like web servers do that for the last 25 years as far as I know. They don't have like one thread per request, they have a worker, and they have as many workers as there are CPU cores because obviously you can't do more things in parallel than you have CPU cores, really. So um, having workers that work on workload items in a queue would be much cleverer. We don't even have to change the buffer architecture for that. We don't have to change any API. We'll just require just um, to rewrite a scheduler. Um, so while I'm still standing here and talking, I should be coding. Um, uh, what that also brings is the fact that we could be a lot smarter about where to put uh, our workload. Um, as it is now, we just put it on the next free CPU core. But we should be having algorithms that actually look at the data dependency and say, hey, that multiply cons block after a compute intense block should just be running right after the compute intense block. There should be things that say, hey, it would be super cool computationally if you could produce 20,000 items at once, but you know, there's a sound card attached to the end and 20,000 samples, that's half a second. Um, maybe start with 400. Um, because, for example, if there's a sound card attached at the other end, the rate's not gonna kill your PC um, at all. So there's a lot of smarts that are missing right now. There's a lot of diagnostics that no one has access to, so that's something that we need to tackle soon. Um, I talked about the buffers already, so that leads me to my conclusion, and I'm way over time, so this is gonna be very, very quick. Um, Gnu Radio works well. So that's the reason why you're all sitting here, is Gnu Radio actually works pretty well, right? It actually scales amazingly well. We abandoned the cleverly designed single thread scheduler that you know, built up a whole graph, looked through dependencies, then decided an execution path called blocks sequentially because, well, pro suddenly there were computers with two CPU cores, and surprise, Scott, like badly scaling to two CPU cores is still better than scaling well to one. Um, so 
Um, there's a lot of things that we need to catch up on, but it's really working well at the point. So it's a very universally uh, applicable thing, even if it's not perfectly performing right now. So stick with the radio, it's my first message. Um, also stick with expecting that things might change in the future. I'm not willing nor expecting that anyone wants to change the basic idea that a block has a work function that takes input buffers and produces output. What I'm willing to expect is that things like forecast die because no one's willing to actually implement that because it's like something that's not central to the actual task being solved. So expect changes. If you're in the business of making things go fast, um, you know, get in touch with me. Um, I'm very interested in things going fast. Um, yeah, and with that, I hope I'm open for a few questions, but yeah, I, I think we might be at the end of the day, so thank you very much for your attention, and I'm open for questions. As far as I know, uh, there is uh, one uh, Python virtual machine uh, in the, the, the whole uh, GNU radio process. And uh, how is it possible that uh, there is no uh, that the Python global interpreter lock doesn't prevent several threads from uh, executing concurrently? So, um, um, so this, this, OK, I have to like kind of take an excursion here. So GNU Radio is a C++ framework and it has Python bindings. What that means is um, basically you can call GNU Radio functionality from Python. First of all, that's super hands hand handy when you construct blocks and connect them because you don't want to do that in C++, you want to do that in a dynamic scripting language. Um, but it also works the other way around. And that's the point here. Um, we can have, for example, GNU Radio calling Python functions. You can even write your own signal processing block in Python. But Python is a bit special as a, pro, as a scripting language. It has the Python interpreter has one lock globally that avoids that you do stupid things concurrently, like, for example, deallocating memory that someone else might be using still. So, um, um, and the point is, yes, there's actually just one Python machine running in a typical radio system. So that, that limits the concurrency of uh, Python blocks. Um, I actually don't know whether that's a solved problem. So mm, I, I must admit that I'd have to look into the gateway block that does all the marshalling. But I think it's pretty possible that there's only one Python block running at a time. But that's not a problem for most blocks, because most blocks, especially these that are concerned with handling data at high rates, are written in C++. And they can run in as many in parallel as they want, as long as they adhere to basic sledding decency, which most of all do, <laughs> which is not all. So I think the gentleman is on, and then. Okay. Uh, yes, is there a way to actually uh, look, uh, take a high level look at the GNU radio uh, graph and then actually uh, separate it in clock domains and then actually make one? Uh, uh, central work function for a complete clock domain. So yeah, um, that that um, I mean, there it has, doesn't have to be a work function. It can still be a sequence of work calls. Um, but that's basically the idea of the of the worker model. Is basically you look at the flow graph, you say this is a path. Graph wise, this is a path. This is just connected blocks in a row. Would make a lot of sense if I call them sequentially because then I don't lose the cache locality of the data. So that's. That's exactly where this is going. And I, honestly, it's happening most of the time in the current scheduling system because, again, operating systems are awesome. Got, got to stress that they are awesome at scheduling things cleverly, um, but it's all just heuristics. There's no data dependency actually being used in, in that scheduling. OK, um, thank you for the talk. Very interesting. Um, one thing that uh, I've heard um, especially from, from colleagues of mine who like working in data flow kinds of, a, of, a, of systems that has prevented many people from using new radio is the dynamic readaptation of the graphs. 
So yeah, that's and this is something which which is um, very interesting, and many people that I've known have so breaking their heads trying to figure out a solution. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that? that's 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 a good point. So um, I didn't even touch on that point because it would have taken you very long to to introduce. But basically, the moment you have like a block set up, Gnradio assumes that there's, this is the uh, the flow graph set up. This is the flow graph that you're going to execute until the end. You start it and then it's finished at some point. Of course, that's not true. You can say, hey, I want to, you know, disconnect that block, thus disabling the scheduling of that block, and connect a different block. But what you would have to do is, like, say, flow graph stop, then everything grinds to a halt, <laughs> then flow graph connect this and that, disconnect this and that, flow graph start, and everything starts anew. And there's so many problems with that. First of all, like, we make no hard, like, requirements for blocks to actually support stop and start. So this, this can go very wrong with hard resources and things. <laughs> then uh, we make, um, we have a lot of problems if we have like this tag position problem that, that is already hard when you have a resampler in there. What's, what's your tag position if you're just a freshly connected block? Okay, then we have to reset everything to zero or what? And things, oh, the things get really complicated. So this is something that's very inherently hard to solve with the uh, fixed, I notify people when I've, I'm done with my work thing and everything is relative to the global idea of having a buffer, ring buffer in between. Mm -hmm. I hope and I th really think this is easier when we have a workload item because I just stop sending them always to the same guy. I just say, this is the guy I want to send to. And if I want to send things to a different block, I just say, okay, from now on, I send them to a different block. And that's actually how other projects that are very like grass slash potos actually do that more of, of, of the individualistic way. They just send things everywhere. And to be honest, that's a pretty well proven concept considering that like this is how Ethernet works. And um, yeah, that, that's one of the, the reasons that RFNOC has some interesting properties. It does support that, but no one's doing that because it's hard to do with a system that looks like Noradio. So, yeah, reconfiguration of flow graphs is hard and not going to be solved with the current architecture. Any further questions? No one is. Yeah. <laughs> no one is asking. I have many questions. Yeah. Um, so, um, about 3.8, what can we expect? Um, <laughs> awesomeness. Um, mostly awesomeness. So, um, Bit of background on radio has been 3.7 point something for gotta lie, 10 years? No, 9, no, 10-ish years by now. So um, there was a bit of a backlog when it comes to architectural things. Uh, often these, like all the changes in 3.8 aren't actually like dig this deep. There's none of what I sketched here is gonna be implemented in 3.8, definitely not. Because we're in like the final breath of getting everything working. Um, and we know that most changes will not be breaking the basic principles. Um, what you can expect is, first of all, that a lot of tools get better. Um, we can do, finally use Python 3. So this, this is like my main headache was that Python 2 is so bad in 2019. Um, we can, um, we get rid of a lot of things that we can't maintain anymore. Um, we used to have WX GUIs, which were actually pretty okay. Um, problem is that we literally have not a single person who knows how to maintain these. So um, there's, there was a simple decision. There was Python code. It's not Python 3 compatible. No one knows how it's written. We can't port it to 3.8. So that's, that's gone. Um, uh, what will also happen is that well, I get very much more aggressive in releasing uh, earlier, more often. That means that as soon as 3.8 is out, we instantly start developing for 3.9, which means that 3.8 will then be a maintenance release that you can use to write your stable software for, um, and probably should use if you're not planning to do bleeding edge stuff. Um, but it's not like new features will appear in 3.8 anymore. It's like 3.7 at this point. 3.7, we 
take very much care that 3.7 doesn't break. So um, I, most of my maintenance time actually goes into making sure that everything in 3.7 is consistent and I'm not breaking API when patching some bug in 3.7. Um, and basically the promise is that we'll be doing that for a couple of years. Turns, depends on how well 3.8 gets adopted and 3.9 and so on. Um, but yeah, what to expect 3.8 is really like an incremental release from a user's point of view. From a developer's point of view, it's breaking free. It's basically saying, okay, we don't have to support Microsoft Visual Studio 2002. That's, um, that, that means that basically we're much more aggressive in terms of, you know, someone has a cool feature, get it in there for 39. So yeah, that's, that's what's happening mostly. <laughs> so, is there any other question? Yeah, I, I can do this like, an exercise takes 90 minutes, and you're only doing cool questions, so. Uh, thanks a lot, the effort you put in maintaining and all the volunteers. Well, I, I'm, I'm gonna like, I'm not the only volunteer yeah. in the room. Like, there's people literally organizing a, a, a conference here, so um, um, I'd be, I, I'll hand that on, um, thank you very much. So. Yeah, my question is like a lot of implementation we have today, they involve FPGAs because not uh, to get the data rates or the processing speed, we need FPGAs. Yeah. That involves like a lot of frictions yeah. because it takes like a lot of time to get those things running. So from GNU Radio point of view, what optimizations would you recommend so that we can try to avoid having FPGAs, if possible? So. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that I'd say to that. First of all, um, premature optimization is the root of all evil, so really, really, really look at what your flow graph does. Really figure out where your time goes. Is it really the block that you think it is? Often it's not. So get out your tools. Like, Norelia does have a slightly broken control port, which would usually give you information on, okay, that block used like on average so and so many microseconds per sample to um, calculate its output. And it in total used so and so many percent of the overall CPU time spent by GNU Radio. Um, but what I've really found helpful under Linux is the perf tool, which says, okay, these are the threads that are running. And like basically, or now otherwise, it actually is a sampling system. It looks at the CPU, like it halts, like it interrupts the CPU, says, hey, where's your uh, instruction pointer at now? And then it just bubbles upwards and figures out uh, which, which function you're in. And then it gives you a rundown of, okay, the work function of the resampler block consumes 80% of my time. So that, that gives you a good idea that the resampler might actually be the thing that, that's killing you, and it might be interesting to either optimize that, I'm always open for contributions, um, or actually get, get your hardware to run at the right rate. So that's, that's a different thing. Then, yes, there's a lot of friction in the FPGA world. Um, that is a bit inherent to the FPGA world, knowing their tools and their workflows. Um, but there's also, so that's something that, that I can solve. So what I, 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 I hope that we can solve is um, the friction of talking to FPGAs. There's a lot of things that are going on in the interface. As I mentioned, like we need to have flexible data interfaces. Um, but there's also a lot of room for things like, okay, I want to implement something in an FPGA so that it's running faster afterwards. But the first thing I'm going to do is uh, like write a test bench in Verilog or system very lock, so I can test my implementation, which I will later use with my radio software thing that was super easy to write after having written a super hard to write test bench in a HDL. So what I really hope that will work out is um, having uh, FPGA or uh, HDL simulation in software uh, as part of what radio can do. Um, I actually like, we have a more than a test balloon, we ha actually have a student working full time on that um, due, uh, through the Google Summer of Code program. Um, and that's, I'm, I'm totally amazed by what he does. Um, basically, the idea is to use Verilator, which converts Verilog to C++ code, 
just compile that, link that in, and then you know, run your simulated Verilog code before you actually put it on FPGA and you know, get the friction down at least when it comes to the DSP part. Other questions? Paul wants to ask a question. No, I just want to uh, end the question session, I guess, because there's a uh, lot of stuff waiting for us, and we certainly can keep asking you questions there, I hope. Yeah. So let's <laughs> yeah. ask, let's thank him. Let's talk. And all the speakers today.